Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is May 6th, 2021. And today I am super excited for uh, an interview that I've wanted to do for uh, quite some time. Uh, today we are interviewing Luna Lindsay Corbden, and we are going to be discussing in depth a really important book. Um, this book was uh, referred to me by numerous people, uh, including Anthony Miller and my good friend Randy Bell. Uh, I think even Natasha Helfer mentioned it at one point or another. The book is called Recovering Agency, Lifting the Veil of Mormon Mind Control. And I think it's an important book for all sorts of reasons. Um, just to talk a little bit about uh, Luna, and then we're going to go into uh, their book and, uh, and to Luna's background story as well. Um, this uh, this is going to be a multi-part series on Mormon Stories podcast. And, uh, you know, the people that have reached out to me about Luna have told me that they are an incredible writer. Uh, they, they edit a lot of books for other people, uh, that this book is really important. But what's most interesting about this book in particular is that is that um, Luna um, has, has basically learned a bunch about uh, social psychology and has applied... Uh, the principles of so social psychology as they relate to undue influence or coercion, you could even say mind control or um, and sort of the, the types of behaviors often employed by high demand religions or cults. Luna has applied these principles to high demand religions and the Mormon church. Uh, and, and so that's what the book is about. Uh, this book explores 31 different techniques used by high demand religions and the Mormon church to exert, let's just say, undue control or influence on its members. And so, uh, you know, the, the reason why Luna has done this is because, um, you know, once you, when you've been raised in a high demand religion, uh, sometimes it becomes really hard to unpack everything you've learned and to tease out or separate what's dogma or doctrine or theology from basically who, you know, who am I or who are you? That's a process that, that people need to go through. And if you're not uh, thoughtful and careful about doing that, it can take a lot longer to unpack and process and kind of liberate yourself from uh, ideologies or teachings that might be holding you back in your life. And Mormon Stories Podcast wants to help people um, heal and grow from their uh, relationship with Orthodox Mormonism. So this is going to be a, an, an epic five-part series. If any of you uh, remember, several years ago, I did something similar to this with James, Dr. James Nagel. And, um, but this is kind of Luna's more updated and uh, in-depth approach. It's not just PowerPoint slides. It's literally an amazing book that is available on Amazon. Again, Recovering Agency, Lifting the Veil of Mormon Mind Control. Uh, a little bit about Luna. Um, Luna, who also, Luna Corbden, who also writes as Luna Lindsay, was born into the LDS Church and left the faith in 2001 at age 26. Uh, they now live in Washington State and write about topics of interest to them, including psychology, mind control, culture, and autism. They also write science fiction and fantasy novels and write short stories of speculative fiction publications like the Journal of Unlikely Entomology, Cross Genres, and the Recognized Fascism Anthology. When they're not busy traveling to improbable worlds, they're thinking hard about this improbable world. And I'll add, Luna, and I hope you're okay with me mentioning this, that uh, Luna identifies as gender non-binary. Um, this is uh, this is sort of something that many of us are just coming to understand in the past several years. My eldest child, uh, who goes by Adrian now, um, also recently came out to Margie and I and our family as gender non-binary. Um, the way Adrian describes it, it is a, let's just say, a, a sub-identity within the broader umbrella of, of tra a transgender identity. That's at least how Adrian describes it. Uh, my, my child, Adrian, goes by they, them pronouns, not, not uh, he, him, or she, her pronouns. And, 
and uh, that's why also, uh, Luna, that that when we read your biography, we we use they them pronouns. So I I don't mean to be throwing too much at our audience, but uh, I I think representation is important and education is important, and that's why I want to take the time up front. And I hope I haven't stepped on any toes as I with that introduction. But but Luna, yeah. welcome to Mormon Stories Podcast. Great. Thanks. That means a lot to me. Um, I do believe in representation and uh, that's one reason why I came out. So here I am. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah. um, I I do want to give you a chance to tell uh, listeners all about yourself, anything you want to add to the introduction or correct, because sometimes I get muddled when I'm doing this on the fly. Sure. We, we do have a slide where I uh, have bullet points if you want to bring that yeah. up. Okay. That's okay. But nothing of, else for the, nothing. Most of it. okay, good, good, good. Yeah. All right. So what are the, for our audio listeners, there are going to be visuals, really good visuals for this presentation. You w I'll do my best to make sure and describe uh, all this in audio form so that our audio listeners can uh, make the most of this presentation, but you can also uh, open this presentation on YouTube and YouTube, by the way, if you, if you purchase the premium account allows you to listen in the background, even while the while the iPhone or the Android is is, uh, is locked, so people don't always realize that that you can kind of watch, listen on YouTube, and even have it locked at times and still be listening without actually viewing it. I just want to make sure people know about that. But without any further ado, Luna, let's go to this amazing presentation. Awesome! Thanks a lot. Uh, let's see if there's anything on the next slide that All we right. can cover. Um, yeah, go go ahead and just start. do your intro. Go ahead and just do your intro and, and tell us about yeah. yourself. Sounds good. Um, well, uh, we, like we've already said, I was born in the church. I was born in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, I spent 26 years true believing, um, mostly active, except for a couple of years. Um, but even then, I was still mentally active. Um, I My um, career before uh, becoming a writer was I spent 14 years in the computer industry in various IT roles, everything from uh, support tier one through tier three support roles, uh, sales engineer, systems engineer. Um, and I left that field in 2010, 2011. Uh, now I'm a, an author uh, and I just write a little bit of everything. And um, I am both gender fluid, which is one of the non-binary genders and bisexual. We talked about, I go by they, them pronouns. Um, I am an abuse survivor um, and I am autistic and um, PTSD. Um, so I'm also in the disabled category, um, in a number of ways. Um, I don't have a degree. I just want everyone to know that I'm not a related degree anyway. My degree is in computers. Um, I'm a psychology nerd, so I just really love psychology and I like thinking about it and reading about it and studying about it, different areas of that, specifically trauma and manipulation and, um, what we'll be talking about today. So those are some of the fields I'm most interested in. Um, and I wrote a book about LDS control topics. Uh, tactics, which is the topic of today. So, uh, yeah. Excellent. Well, well, we're so glad to have you. Did do you, I'm just curious, did you ever end up watching, did you ever see that James Nagel presentation I did several I, years ago? I did. I watched about half of it. So I don't, um, I have a hard time listening to podcasts because um, part of autism is my ADHD part. So I have, um, I can tend to get distracted by audio input. So, um, I watched about as much of it as I could before my mind started to wander, which is just a defect of mine. No worries. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or a feature. Maybe that's a feature, not a bug. It, it is though. Yeah. There's a lot of advantages to it. So I can jump from one yeah. thing to another if I need to, even when yeah. I don't want to, when I want to as well. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm just really thrilled to hear your your approach uh, to applying social psychology to Mormonism. So let's jump in. Great, yeah. Um, I don't know how much of my exit story you want to hear. It's not. Very yeah, yeah. Funny. No, let's start there. Let's start there. Okay. Let's start um, a little bit about your background. Yeah, it's it's not terribly interesting because it gets into artificial intelligence and science fictiony kind of stuff. No, let's um, do it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll try to give an abbreviated version. So in 2001, I was in some internet chat rooms that were really nerdy. And they were talking about this thing called the technological singularity, which is the idea that human beings are going to invent something that is smarter than us. And when we do, because it's smarter than us, it will be able to invent and discover everything at a much more rapid pace. That's where the word singularity comes from, because it's a mathematically you start getting this arc where we're progressing all of a sudden, technologically, we're progressing an infinite amount or near infinite amount. 
So I was studying that and every everybody was saying all doom and gloom. You know, this is this is the story that Terminator follows and the Matrix, the idea that these robots we create will enslave us or destroy us. And um, I was thinking about it and I was like, why? Why would that be a bad thing necessarily? Why would why would this why would we invent a monster? Why why wouldn't it potentially be a kind or good or benevolent being that we create? And so I started um, I wrote an essay. And while I was writing this essay, I got really in depth in terms of what is creativity and what is intelligence and what traits would this being have to have in order to be what it is. And through that process, I sort of realized how difficult it is to grok or understand in a deep way what what something beyond us really is. Um, that it would be like explaining to an ant what a nuclear reactor is and what it does. Like that would be what this being would be to us trying to explain what it's doing and why it's doing it. And through that process, I did conclude that this being would just as likely be a benevolent being as it would be evil. But I had this little niggling thought that was at the corner of my, of my mind that I was just like, hold on just a minute and wait till I'm done with this essay. And when I, when I finished the essay and put it on the web, it's still on the web. Um, I was a fledgling writer at the time, so it's probably not very good. Um, but as I hit, hit send on that, I, I suddenly realized that the being I had described was God. And it was mm. such an incomprehensible being that I had concluded that this artificial intelligence would be, that it just hit me that no, no person claiming to speak for God could really speak for God. Again, it, it, not only would it be like, trying to explain to an ant what a nuclear reactor is for. It would be like explaining to one ant what a nuclear reactor is for and then telling that ant to go tell all the other ants what a nuclear reactor is for. And and what why would a human think that that's a good idea? In other words, why would God think it's a good idea to tell one human to go tell the other human what it's all what it's all about? And it just m- my mind expanded on what a god would be to this huge thing that Mormonism and all other revealed um, patriarchal religions do is they they put God in this little human shaped box. I couldn't anymore. I just I I couldn't with any revealed God. Um, there are other versions of gods that are more interesting and less in a box, more expansive. Um, but the patriarchal authoritarian gods didn't fit it for me. I spent about three months. Uh, that was in November of two thousand. And there were a lot of events leading up to that, by the way, a lot of destabilizing events. That was just sort of the crux of it all. I, my shelf broke, basically. Um, and uh, yeah, finally, um, in January was when I just sort of finally crossed the line and was like, okay, I'm not Mormon anymore. I was just, what if, what if? And that following year was really unstable for me. Um, I questioned everything. If this much of my reality was not true. I was also going through political transition at the time, realized becoming disillusioned with um, my, my conservative political background, um, transferring into libertarianism, which is at the time what I was moving in towards. And so two of these most major realms of my world were just had the rug yanked out and that made me question everything about reality. And so um, as, as I went on, I, I, that year was just really shaky and I had to question all my morals. I had to start from scratch. Well, is murder okay? Is robbing okay? And I came up with logical moral arguments for why the moral structure that I have now is what it is, which I do think murder is wrong and I think stealing is wrong and I think honesty is still a good trait and all of that, but I had to question all of it. Um, and so leading up to the writing of this book, and I'll, I'll try to keep it short, Um, a friend of mine was, um, with someone in Seattle a few years later and, uh, this person, she was trying to sort of recruit me to her little family. Um, and ironically, it turned out she was also running a cult, a little family size cult. But she said to me one day in her attempts to convert me, uh, she said to me, you know, you're ex Mormon. Have you ever been deprogrammed? Um, and I was like, come on, I don't need to be deprogrammed. I've figured it all out. I'm fine now. Um, But it, it sat with me for a while. I was just like, this doesn't, this isn't, something's wrong here. Um, There's things that I feel like I can't overcome. There's hangups that I have that I don't understand the origin of. And so I was like, well, let's give this a try. So I bought a couple books and started reading and I just couldn't stop. I bought more books and I bought more books. And these are books written by cult researchers Um, I also read memoirs of people who had been through cults, cult experiences. None of them had anything whatsoever to do with Mormonism. The word Mormon wasn't mentioned in a single one. Um, 
these were all describing other cults. Sometimes generically, they would research a lot of cults and say, here's what these all have in common. Some of them were specifically looking at individual cults um, in particular. Um, and they, they, a number of them listed these different mind control techniques and these patterns of behavior that um, both leaders of cults and followers of cults would fall into. And it was really, you know, I marked them up, I underlined, I wrote in the margins, and it was really helpful for me to separate who I was from what had been done to me and to really learn and get to the root of who I really was so they could make conscious decisions. Um, that's the title of my book, where that comes from, Recovering Agency. It was It's about getting my free agency back um, because when we can't, understand the decisions that we're making, we can't really make those decisions. So it's about understanding those decisions so that we can make it with awareness. And if it's okay, I mean, we're hitting right off, right off the bat of uh, maybe one of the most delicate and fraught topics for some, and that's how offensive and problematic and shocking and resonant it can be, depending on who you're talking to, to mention the word cult alongside mm -hmm. the LDS church or the Mormon church. And I'll just, just to introduce that idea, you know, we've had Stephen Hassan on Mormon stories already. He has a book called combating cult mind control. And even the world's leading expert on cults recognizes that it's, it's pretty much always not useful to use the word cult when talking to an Orthodox member of any high demand religion or cult, because it creates the backfire effect. Mm -hmm. um, it's just Mormons consider it offensive. Uh, I, I've uh, just recently, I've been interacting with some formal well-known Mormon apologists. And just the fact that I had an episode, you know, where I talked to some, ty some Scientologists about Mormonism and, and mentioned the word cult, was deeply offensive to them and enough to have them maybe, you know, reconsider the desire to even come on Mormon stories podcast. And so right. it's, it's problematic at the same time. I think it's undeniable that if you actually just go through the criteria of a high demand religion or cult, and I did this, uh, in, in combating cult, my control, I found that the Mormon church strongly meets criteria or moderately meets criteria for something like, 90, 95% of the criteria that Stephen Hassan lays out. So how do you balance this problem, Luna, of, of wanting to sort of like call a duck a duck, or at least wanting to talk about the, the literature mm -hmm. and, and uh, the understanding within the disciplines of social psychology and the problem of offending people, of turning people off, of creating the backfire effect? How do you think about all that? It is a loaded term, and I agonized over the title of my book. I wanted, you know, I've got multiple audiences, and I, I tried to struggle with who I was trying to speak to. Um, you know, if if I was speaking to Mormons, true believing Mormons, Orthodox Mormons, uh, I'm, I'm not going to reach them anyway. And so I decided to target ex-Mormons and Mormons who aren't happy with being Mormon. And um, and at the time, by the way, the ex-Mormon community and the fringe Mormon or progressive Mormon communities were sort of oil and water. They did not get along. We didn't get along with each other at all. And I, I always wondered about that. And I didn't like that situation. Um, but I, I did. I agonized over that because I wanted people who were curious about mind control or Mormonism's cult status to be able to find my work. But I also didn't want that loaded term to create a reaction in some of the people I wanted to reach. Um, I've gotten some feedback on my cover. If you go to the next slide and then the slide after that's also related to this topic. Um, you know, I, this, this imagery of, a of the temple just breaking open and all the light that's being caged inside the temple, finally just breaking free. It's like the, the temple is a prison for all of that light that belongs to everyone. That's sort of the imagery I came up with. I have gotten feedback. Oh, I would give this to my relative or so-and-so if it weren't for the you know title or the cover. Um, so to some extent, I, I may have made the wrong decisions, but that's the decision I went, went for. Um, the next slide we'll talk about a little bit more of the different terms that I've found in the research that describe it more specifically that are harder to argue with. Um, of course, brainwashing is also a very loaded term, um, but coercive persuasion, thought reform, so, uh, psychosocial manipulation, 
spiritual abuse, traumatic bonding, which is often seen in abuse survivor circles, but it's the same technique or the same dynamic, um, behavioral change technology, compliance gaining influence, and for cult, there's dogma, ideological totalism, high demand group, and long-term influence situations. And all of those are really unwieldy. It's hard to put in a sentence. They're very self-defining. Like you, It's hard to argue that Mormonism isn't a high demand group. I mean, even, even as a true believing Mormon, I think I would have probably agreed with that term. Um, but they're harder to put in a sentence. So it is a double bind, which will, is a technique we'll talk about. Um, and honestly, groups like this, like the Mormon church, want this to be complicated. They want it to be hard to communicate about these topics, because if it's hard to communicate, then it's hard for believers to learn these things and leave, um, to, to question their beliefs. And that is, is actually a whole topic, loading the language. We won't get to that today, but that is what's going on here when these terms become really charged. So I use all the terms. Um, it, a lot depends on the situation. If I want to get people's attention, I use cult, but I realize that it's a sensational term. Um, when I want to be descriptive and academic about it, I use high demand group as my or a totalist. Uh, I don't think I put it on this list. Totalism is another really great word, and we'll talk about. No, totalism. it's there. It's there. Yeah. Ideological oh, it? totalism. Yeah, Got it. under yeah. cult. Yeah. 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 Okay. Great. All right. Yeah. So next slide. So uh, I just want people to know I didn't invent all of these ideas. I did organize them into a certain way, and I did show how they map to Mormonism, but. These are some of the other prominent authorities in the field who are far more knowledgeable about this stuff than I am. These are people with degrees um, who have dedicated their lives to this topic. Um, you've already mentioned Stephen Hassan. Um, Robert J. Lifton, who is sort of one of the earliest researchers in this, he studied um, the um, Chinese concentration camps in North Korea um, and, and the brainwash. That was when it was called brainwashing that occurred in those. Leon Festinger, a social psychologist who studied um, things like cognitive dissonance. Uh, John Jalalich and Madeline Landu Tobias wrote a, a couple of really good books, um, as did Margaret Thaler Singer. Michael Langoni currently runs the International Cultic Studies Association. Um, I'm, I'm an advisory board member um, for that, which sounds more important than it is. Um, I just give them advice every once in a while. Um, and, but that is an organization where all of these academics meet um, at several conferences a year to discuss these things. Um, and uh, Robert Cialdini, who's another so social psychologist who studies more, um, less about specific groups and more about the broad, like how marketing works and how um, manipulation works for salespeople and things like that. It's a great book. I, I've read one of Robert's books. It's, it's yeah. a classic. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty good. Yeah. Okay. Oh, next slide. So I like the word totalism. Oh, unless you had a question. No, no, no. Let's do it. I like the word totalism because it's really broad. It can apply to everything from um, an individual, like a domestic abuse situation, and it, all the way up to governments. So governments can be to what totalitarianism or totalism. And in a totalistic um, situation, the ideology must come first. There's nothing more important than the ideology, not the not even the individual. And it fills every part of your life and, and the leaders or the group guide your decisions and, you know, everything from what you eat to what you wear to who you marry or what genders you can marry um, to what jobs you can take, what jobs are off the table. Um, and it doesn't just apply to religions. It's really important to know um, that anything, any system just about can be made into a totalist situation. So that includes political groups, businesses, large group awareness training. That's what LGAT stands for. That's things like um, landmark, landmark forum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was in one of those too, by the way, the Mormons had, we had a little one that was going around in the eight, late eighties, early nineties. That was, uh, I think it was called quest impact. And I actually went, went through the first uh, one of those. So um, and just about anything else, activism groups, um, like I mentioned, family systems, the, the, the lady I knew that ran that cult that my friend was in um, was just a, a, fa a household. There was five or six people living together and that was it. But she had doctrines and everything. You don't have to have doctrines, though. It could be a, a system for running a business. Um, it could be a system for self-improvement or meditation. 
Um, and these also use natural tendencies. There's nothing woo or mystical here. It feels very natural to be in these situations, partly because we have a lot of shortcuts, mental shortcuts that we like to take. And the, the totalistic system takes advantage of those. Um, but they feel, feel very normal to be in that. Um, and this is a, a very successful strategy for an organization to propagate itself and to retain members, but it's very maladaptive for the individual. Um, as as many of us have experienced. Yeah, but I like to, when, when I've held retreats and stuff, I talk a little bit about this, but the benefit, uh, the benefits of a high demand religion are also the drawbacks because uh, a, a religion like Mormonism, it, it tells you, it, it gives you an identity, it gives you a morality, it gives you a framework for spirituality, it tells you where you came from, why you're here and where you're going, it gives you a patriarchal blessing that maps out your entire life for you, it educates you or indoctrinates you for, you know, three, <clears throat> three plus, three to 10 to 20 hours a, a week. Mm -hmm. And uh, it tells you where you're going. You know, like I said, when you die, it tells you who to marry, when to marry, how to marry, how many kids to have. There's something really freeing about all that in the sense that life can, you can get lost. Mm -hmm. It can be scary. It can be sad. Um, and it can be confusing and you can really mess up and ruin your life and get to a really dark, scary place. And so a high demand religion just says, hey, you don't have to worry about any of that. Just mm -hmm. join this. Here's what you believe. Here's what you do. And you can have a happy, healthy life. And it can be so enticing um, for, for people that otherwise might feel afraid or lost in life, right? Absolutely. And it's a really good fit for a lot of people. And uh, honestly, for, for people that come to me and say, hey, Mormonism is great. I love it. It's perfect for me. Then I'm like, good. Uh, go live your life. Go be. That's your choice to be Mormon, to be a true believing Mormon and to follow that. Um, I have a, a chapter in my book that I don't have slides for. It's about square pegs. And a lot of people don't fit Mormonism. It's not, you know, when, when, you, when you're given a choice and that's the choice you would have chosen otherwise, then it, it's, it's easy to say, well, I have a choice. I'm choosing this. But when you're, when you don't fit that mold, then it's a whole other thing. So like for me, I'm autistic, I'm queer. And I didn't know I was queer at the time, but I was. Um, I'm also, you know, as um, having been raised as a woman and being in the church as a woman, I was, I went against all of those gender roles, um, even not dealing with trans issues. That was just, I wanted a career. I was technical. I was um, into math and science. And I, I, I dreamed of being a physicist when I was in high school. Um, and, and then I wanted to be a musician. I wanted to play piano and, and write, compose things. And that was kind of off the table too. It was like, um, it, because I was different for a number of reasons, it, it always just kind of felt wrong. It was like an itchy sweater and I just wanted to take it off. Um, even though I believed it, um, I think some people, it's not an itch, it's a cashmere sweater. It feels really good on them. Um, and and so I think trying to take perspective from different people is, has been really helpful for me to empathize with people who are still in it for whom it is comfortable. And for them, I don't try to argue with them. I don't try to get them out. Yeah, yeah. And again, our, our point here is not to uh, call names or to denigrate anyone. It's literally for people who have left Mormon Orthodoxy and or are leaving the Mormon Church. It's just to help you make sense of who you are and to help you heal and grow and, and live the best life you can be. We mean no offense yeah. to Orthodox Mormon believers or the church itself. Absolutely. And one more tag onto that is um, when when I am writing about the Mormon church, I am writing about the leaders, the doctrines, and the policies. When I criticize the Mormon church, I am criticizing them. And, and I'm criticizing abusers, like rank and file abusers in the church as well. I'm not criticizing the average daily Mormon whose heart is in the right place, who is living their sincere beliefs. And the Mormon church conflates those two things together. So it's hard to separate you know, oh, you're talking about the church, not about me. Um, that's kind of part of the control mechanisms we're talking about. It creates a defensiveness of like, oh, you're talking about me. You're offending me directly. And I, I'm, I'm really not. I love the Mormon people and I, I want to help those who want to be helped. Um, not, I, I'm, I'm aiming, I'm speaking truth to power, not, I'm not punching down. So. Absolutely. Okay. So, uh, so now, now that we've sort of talked about totalism, I think our listeners can identify with the idea that Mormonism approaches, if not uh, exemplifies a totalist 
Uh, framework, right? Totalist yeah. ideology. Yeah. There's a couple more points about totalism on the next slide. Okay. Um, totalism is ubiquitous, but not universal. So that means that it's everywhere, but it's not in everything. So we can look, you know, I can come up with examples of businesses and political groups and um, multi-level marketing and other sort of business um, ventures and just about everywhere. Um, but that doesn't mean that every single group inherently is totalistic. And it's uh, it's a spectrum. Um, and so even within a single group, the, a person's experience of totalism might vary depending on all kinds of factors, um, how close they are to the inner circle, their gender, um, whether or not they're in a position of leadership or authority, um, uh, all their age, all kinds of different factors can, can change your experience, even with a single group. And every group has their own um, spectrum of where they fall on the totalistic uh, scale. And the best way to defend against totalism, if you're afraid of falling into another group, is learn about it. Um, gain awareness so that you notice those red flags when they come up. I want to read this quote by Robert Lifton, who um, he's he's an old timey writer. He, his, he published his book in 1962. And there's really only one chapter that really focuses on this stuff. I think it's chapter 21 or 22. And um, but he writes in this, like, it's kind of this old timey language with these long sentences, but he always packs so much in there. So I have a lot of quotes from him in this. Feeling himself unable to escape from forces more powerful than himself, he subordinates everything to adapting himself to them. He becomes sensitive to all kinds of cues, expert at anticipating environmental pressures, and skillful in writing them in just such a way that his psychological energies merge with the tide rather than turn painfully against himself. I like to think about that quote a lot. It's in my book. If you want to meditate on that, or you can, um, the chapter, which the chapter that it is in is available free on the internet. So I think if you just search Robert J. Lifton thought reform and the psychology of totalism, you can actually read that chapter. So. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's a great, great quote. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, what yeah. is, I think our next topic is cognitive dissonance. Yeah, and a lot of people might have heard about this, depending on uh, what circles you run in. But this is a, a an idea that was developed by Leon Festinger in the 50s. He did uh, a number of experiments, and those experiments have been repeated dozens of times, and uh, variations on them have been repeated dozens more. This is a very well-established um, idea within the or theory within the field of psychology. Um, I think there's very little controversial about it. Um, you know, like Alice in Wonderland, who um, was afraid of believing six things before breakfast, impossible things before breakfast, um, cognitive dissonance is what uh, keeps keeps us sane. It keeps us from just believing every random thought that comes to us. But it also is the mechanism that malicious groups use to make us believe uh, impossible things. Um, so next slide. Oh, so are you, are you going to give us, will you give us some examples of cognitive dissonance and, and probably, um, uh, let's see how long this goes on. Uh, it, sure. I can give some examples. Yeah. I yeah, mean, it, let's just, let's lay out the framework just at a high level. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I've got more slides on this coming up. Um, okay. Okay. I do. I have more slides coming up. Okay. So, so the next slide is just, it gives a contrast of what those impossible things can entail. They can be harmless and mostly fun or they can be all the way up to the brutal and harmful, uh, like the images show. I have a, uh, the images show a bus with a bunch of hippies on it. It's a colorful bus. Um, and the other one shows uh, during the Inquisition, um, someone being run through with a sword. So it can be, it can, it can be innocent and fun, and, but th this can also be used uh, to create a lot of mayhem for a lot of people. Now, um, I know we're, we're going to be talking about this later, but let me just see if yeah. I can remember my festinger basically. So it, tell me if I'm right about this. So it's ideal if, if a humans, what their thoughts and their beliefs mm -hmm. align with their, with their behavior and with their understanding mm -hmm. of the world. Right. Yes. And feelings. So, and their um, feelings. Yeah. So the idea is we want to feel integrated. We want to feel sane. We want to feel, we don't want to feel like hypocrites. We want to feel like we have integrity. And so it's the mechanism through which we keep all of that together. We we feel like at least that all of the gears or the pieces within our mind are fit are fitting together pretty well. Um, so we'll get to that. We'll get to that soon. And I'll explain like all the mechanisms. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So Voltaire famously said, as it's often paraphrased, paraphrased, 
Um, whoever can make you believe the Im impossible can make you do the unthinkable. And this is the full quote here. Um, translated, of course, is originally in French. Truly, whoever is able to make you absurd is able to make you unjust. If the God-given understanding of your mind does not resist a demand to believe what is impossible, then you will not resist a demand to do wrong. As soon as one faculty of your soul has been dominated, other faculties will follow. And from this derives all those crimes of religion or totalism, which I added, um, which have overrun the world. And so that's Love kind it. of the, that's the stakes. That's the consequences of when we allow or uh, fall into a pattern where someone else is pulling the levers and turning the knobs of our cognitive dissonance. So our, by understanding it ourselves, we can then take that back and own it for ourselves. I love it. I just finished reading uh, Candide by Voltaire for hmm. a book club. It's it's such a great book. And he really is an OG in understanding undue influence. Yeah, yeah. I think I read Candide a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, oh, I, this slide is in the wrong place. So I'm going to, the next slide, the cult exit recovery slide, I put it in the wrong, I don't know what I did. We'll talk about that after cognitive dissonance. Okay, I'll so come back to it. Back Just to tell that. me okay. when to come back to it, yeah. All right. Um, so as I mentioned, um, this was come up, came up with by Festinger. Um, and again, the idea is that we have to have internal consistency. It's a survival drive. Um, again, so we're not scattered all over the place. And when our ancestors um, were trying to survive in, in the desert or the jungle, um, you know, there were certain beliefs that were that saved their lives and certain beliefs that didn't. And that's from an evolutionary standpoint, that's kind of where all this came from. Um, Festinger said, a man with conviction is a hard man to change. Tell him you disagree and he turns away. Show him facts or figures and he questions your sources. Appeal to logic and he fails to see your point. And I'm sure many of us can relate to that regardless of our current beliefs. We've always we've run into someone who we feel like that about. Um, so next slide. Now we'll get into the me mechanisms. Uh, this is the nerdy part. So a cognition is simply defined as any single unit of an idea, a feeling, an experience, a goal, a value, a commitment, a memory, a perception, something someone told us one time, behaviors, any single unit of a thing that we're trying to fit together with the other things. Um, so I, I like to visualize them as gears um, in, say, a machine. Um, you know, where you got all the gears going together. And the idea is when, next slide. When a new idea comes into us, a new fact or thought or behavior or example of something that we see, if it matches the current machine that we're running in our head, we feel good about it. And that's called consonance. We, it's, it's that preaching to the choir feeling that, ha, that, that rush of feeling that we get. It can be any emotion, by the way. These are all, it's a, it's a group of positive emotions. It can be euphoric. It can be joy. Uh, it can just feel rightness, um, righteousness and self-righteousness included in that. Um, and it gives us a reward. It's the carrot of it. It says, good job you for sticking to your guns. Um, but dissonance is the opposite of that. So we get a new piece of information coming in. It says, um, whoa, hold up that what you believe might be wrong. Then we feel, a, again, it's a group of emotions. It can be one of many different negative emotions. It can be confusion, anger, rage, even on up to rage, where we are ready and willing to kill someone over their challenging of our beliefs. And there are many examples of that uh, in the world today. Um, some examples of that. Let's see if that's the no. Nope, we're still on the slide. Um, yeah. So, so let me example. just see if I can. So, like, if you if you were raised in a Mormon context, mm -hmm. and you believe that the Book of Mormon uh, was written by Native Americans, uh, you you know, as a, as a history, mm -hmm. and then you learn about the findings out of Thomas Murphy or Simon Southerton mm -hmm. that the DNA of the Native Americans actually goes back to Asia and uh, does not go back to Israel as we once thought. That's a new piece of information. Mm -hmm. So you've got the existing schema of your, your worldview and your beliefs about the world. Mm -hmm. And let's just say, uh, actually, let me back up a bit. So you, you, you learn the schema about Native Americans and the Book of Mormon, and then you're in seminary and you're watching a film strip called, uh, you know, something about the, the new world and, and how, you know, uh, archaeologists were traveling through a Mesoamerican temple and they see a little pit that looks like a baptismal font. And, and the narrator in the film strip tells you that little pit 
was a baptismal font, and it shows that ancient Americans were doing baptism ordinances, you know, a, you know, four, five, six hundred years ago. Your brain's going to go, tell me if I'm right, that's going to be consonants. Your brain's going to go, ah, that feels good. It feels good to have someone who is portraying themselves as a scientist give me a new piece of information that fits with my worldview. Ah, that feels really good. And that's a reward to keep on believing that worldview about Native Americans in ancient America. But then let's just say you're, it's 20 years ago and Thomas Murphy or Simon Southerton comes out with this DNA research that shows that that Native Americans, in fact, come from Asia through the Bering Strait, not from boats, you know, via the Middle East. Then all of a sudden you're going to feel yucky. That's going to feel dissonance. It's going to feel, you know, what what Mormons would call the, the adversary or, you know, um, spirit of contention. You'll be confused. You'll feel uncomfortable. You'll thought. feel a stupor of thought, right? Mm -hmm. And, and then uh, you'll say, well, I need to do something with that information because I don't like this feeling of cognitive dissonance. And that's what the dissonance means. It's two things that are kind of out of harmony with each other. Is that right? Exactly. And, uh, okay. and it's not just that one belief about the Book of Mormon that's being threatened. It's your entire structure of beliefs. Everything religious, for sure, but all your political beliefs get thrown in there and your beliefs about human nature and, and psychology and how that why we're here and what what, what what your purpose is in life and your identity it's all connected and threatening that one thing is like threatening your life yeah um, because because immediately if if all of a sudden you're wondering if the book of mormon is true because you you find out new scientific evidence immediately your brain goes well wait a minute i'm in a marriage if you're in a marriage mm -hmm. i'm in a marriage that was based on mormonism yeah. and if i start losing my faith in the church my spouse may leave me and then i may lose my kids and my parents may disown me and then i won't know who i am and then i might lose my job and my whole world i mean literally your brain in just a matter of seconds can go through that whole chain yep. and it make it can make you come back and say ooh that feels awful better find a way to deal with this with this uh, piece of information that's causing me so much internal distress. Is that right? Exactly. And that's okay. a great segue into the next slide, which okay. is about the strategies that Festinger identified that we do use to deal with these things. Okay. So um, the first overarching one is we can alter one of the cognitions, either the new cognition, which is, is probably the most common when it comes to charged uh, topics like politics and religion. And that is to just reject it. That's a lie. That isn't true. They're, they're biased. They're um, motivated um, incorrectly. They're sa satanic. Um, or what happens much more rarely is we can modify the, our existing cognitions. So we could say, I was wrong, which is the, the polite, um, healthy, in my opinion, way to go about it. Or you could even be sort of sour grapes about it. Like, fine, whatever you say, I'll, you just, I'm going to go along with it, but I'm going to sort of do so in a resistant sort of way. Um, we can also add new cognitions to sort of, again, I always picture this machine with all these gears and levers and stuff whirling around. And, um, and I'm, I'm thinking of when I don't, I'm not an engineer, I don't know what I'm talking about. But you know, when when you have two big wheels, and they're not quite touching, you can add a little wheel in the middle, and that makes them all work again. Um, so we can add new cognitions. And that does include remember, these aren't just thoughts or ideas or facts. These are also things like behavior and social feedback. So um, maybe we'll go on a mission to help us deal with our doubts about uh, the, the DNA work uh, that Murphy and Southerington came up with. Um, maybe we'll uh, double down on going to church. Um, well, maybe we'll start praying and reading the scriptures more. Those all help us feel better about our dissonance and social feedback as well. If, if we have everyone around us is saying this is true, then it's easier to dismiss the thing um, that um, isn't fitting. And we can also change the importance of things. So we can accept both the co old cog and the new cog if we change um, how important they are. So one of the examples that I use for this, it isn't a Mormon example, but let's say your um, favorite uh, politician, you've, you've um, campaigned for him, you've gone, um, donated a lot of money for him. And it turns out uh, he had an affair, comes in the news, big headline across the thing, he had an affair. Well, you believe in marital fidelity. That's one of your core beliefs. So you can change your importance of those two conflicting beliefs. You can say, well, 
I didn't really like that politician anyway. Like I'm still going to vote for him, but maybe I'm going to give him a little bit less money or you can alter the, your perception of how important morale that moral is to you, that value. Oh, well, it's okay that he cheated on his wife because, you know, and then I, I, I didn't elect a pastor. I elected a politician, right? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. This isn't about character, you know, but right. meanwhile, you will attack your enemies with the same, you know, it is about character, right? <laughs> or, or you might say, or you might say, well, I care so much about abortion and the Supreme okay. Court that I, I, you know, well, I'm not going to let that affect, you know, that's more important than anything else, right? Exactly. Yeah. So those are the three overall strategies we can use to deal with cognitive dissonance. Um, next slide. Okay. And, and just to, <laughs> just to review just really quickly. So we, we get a new, we get a new cognition that's causing us dissonance. We can either reject, we can either reject the new cognition Mm -hmm. and say, uh, well, the DNA stuff is dumb, or we can go, oh my gosh, maybe maybe the the Book of Mormon isn't what I thought, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, we can we can do our change behaviors like fast and pray and go to the temple mm -hmm. more, do whatever we can um, to try or pray pray for support to try other and forms. help us. What's that? Sorry, other forms of altering too, not just behavior. I added those as examples of things to not forget. Um, but I don't want to de-emphasize that it can include changing a belief. For instance, you could say, well, the Book of Mormon isn't wasn't meant to be literally true. It was meant to be figuratively true, the way that the works of Shakespeare are. Um, and and that's also perfectly acceptable. And by the way, I really respect people who do that. I, I do think that as a work of literature, um, there are some good points in the Book of Mormon, um, some bad points too. Um, and so so, yeah, it's it's about changing changing either the new or the old. Uh, sorry, adding a new cognition that sort of makes it all okay. And like g going to Fair Mormon or you know people you know some of the apologetic mm -hmm. uh, institutions that can be an important way to reinterpret words or gain new information to help us deal or to dismiss the DNA stuff. Uh, it seems like apologetics can be an important way to to manage that cognitive dissonance through new cognitions, correct? Correct. Yeah. Or, yeah. or yeah, new ones. <laughs> yeah. And then of course, just like saying, well, historicity, the book of Mormon, isn't that important. Mm -hmm. It's really, you know, it's really about the core messages of Jesus. That's a way to lower the importance of, for example, book of Mormon historicity that well, that allows you to manage your cognitive dissonance, but still retain the book of Mormon and thus your membership in the church. Exactly. Okay. I just wanted to drive that home. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. No worries. Um, so, and then, and this is how totalism gets in. And, and really that's what my work is about is how totalism exploits cognitive dissonance. Um, I, I believe and this, this is actually sort of original research on my part. Um, I didn't come across anyone else in the literature talking about this, but I personally can describe any of the thought reform techniques through a lens of cognitive dissonance. Here is how it turns dissonance into consonance um, and, or does something else to do with cognitive dissonance. And it can actually convert dissonance into consonance. And we'll come across a couple of examples. Um, I'll probably repeat this in some later presentation, but one really big example is persecution left on its own with no added cognitions would be a dissonance causing um, effect. So those people over there, they're trying to kill me because of my beliefs. That would be like, okay, maybe I should not believe those things and maybe to save my life or to so I can be more comfortable around other people. Um, that would normally cause dissonance, but um, religions like Mormonism have turned persecution into such a, co a consonance causing um, cognition that they see persecution often when there isn't any. Um, they often feel persecuted or have a persecution complex when really the only thing someone's ever done to them is called them a mormie or something like that, right? Like ask them about their magic underwear and that's not really persecution or they might see criticism as persecution because they need the persecution to prove to them that, that their religion is true. Got it. So, and we'll get m more into that. I think I have a slide in some other presentation that actually talks about persecution. So, okay. Got yeah. it. Mm -hmm. All right. Next slide. I think we're still on cognitive dissonance. Yeah. Um, so I come from a computer background, so I like to think of it as an intrusion detection system or antivirus or a firewall. Um, it's basically a pre-installed set system of self-updating patches. So every time your computer runs Windows Update to protect you from the latest vulnerability, um, cognitive dissonance is like that. 
And that's where we get our mental gymnastics from um, that us ex-Mormons like to talk about so much. Um, uh, I also think of a Rube uh, Goldberg machine, which is com overly complex and ridiculous and does almost nothing for you and takes more to maintain um, than it's actually doing. I think of the uh, scene in Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, you know, where, where they make breakfast with this really complicated the egg rolls down and I don't know, the woodpecker cracks it open and it falls and that pulls a string. Um, that's where we get our mental gymnastics from is all the all the cognitive dissonance re remedy strategies that we create in our minds, trying to hold on to something that reality isn't actually reflecting. If, if reality reflected it, we wouldn't need to go through such hoops to in order to continue believing it. Yeah, that makes that makes so much sense. Yeah, that's a great description. I I just remember. I remember that point when I uh, was studying Von Brody and just feeling bombarded with all the problems with the church being true, given Joseph Smith's history and the treasure digging and the Book of Mormon and the mm -hmm. seer stones and the folk magic. And I remember thinking, there's a thousand complicated questions and answers that need to be dealt with if the church is true, mm -hmm. or there's one answer that resolves everything yeah. um, it, that, that's super simple. And that's it. The church isn't what it claims to be that one answer, you know, that, that one answer is so simple and yet it solved all of the problems. And that, that, that's what I think of when I think of a Rube Goldberg machine mm -hmm. inside my brain. Mormon apologetics is like constructing this massive Rube Goldberg machine to try and make it all make sense when, the scientific and naturalistic worldview just don't allow for what, what's being required of us belief wise versus Occam's razor, right? That's the right. simple, you cut away all the comp over overly complicated stuff. Yeah. 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 It all right. Becomes, next sli next simple. slide. Yeah. So this is a, about a particular aspect of cognitive dissonance that Leon Festinger wrote about in when prophecy fails. This is a book um, that you can get again. It's kind of written in like, 60s, 50s, and 60s language, um, but it was really interesting. So what he did was he had a hypothesis in looking at the history of particularly prophetic groups that had predicted the end of the world. And then he noticed a pattern when the end of the world didn't come about. So Anabaptists is a really great example. Um, I forget when they were early 1600s in, uh, they were Dutch, I believe. And, um, and they they preached the end of the world on a certain date and the end of the world came and came and went and didn't end. And all of a sudden they started baptizing people, tons of people, everybody in Holland or wherever it was, whatever city it was, wanted to be baptized all of a sudden. And, and they were going door to door and they were actually succeeding in converting people where, it, whereas, and you would think, why would that happen? Um, shouldn't they be like, well, the end of the world came and went and didn't. So he had an opportunity. So uh, to infiltrate a group that was at the time, um, prophesying the end of the world. And it was a UFO group group. Um, he uses pseudonyms throughout the book, but we have the history now of who he was talking about. Um, I don't remember the details because I read the book more than the Wikipedia page. Um, but uh, so before he infiltrated this group, he uh, he came up with some criteria about how how basically the hypothesis is if if a group meets this criteria, then when when their belief is disconfirmed in a, in an undeniable way, that the group will double down on their beliefs and they will actually begin to pro proselytize more than they ever have before. So the criteria that he came up with were the cognitions must be deeply held, can't be frivolous. The believer has to make irreversible actions. So quitting a job, selling a house, um, telling off family members, they have to be specific to beliefs that are detailed in such a way that they can be disproven or disconfirmed was the word that he used. And they have to be, um, the irrefutable counter evidence has to occur. So the disconfirmation event is what he refers to it as. And then the believer has to have social ties to other believers. This can't just be one person, one crackpot, forgive my word. I'm trying not to use ableist words, but you know, the, if you can't just be the Unabomber sitting in Montana writing your manifestos, you got to have a group. And so he went to this group. Now the group said that on December 21st or whatever the date was, 1954, um, that UFOs were going to come and create a flood and kill everyone. And uh, this group was was going to be the only one saved. The UFOs were going to take them up. 
obviously completely ridiculous. It's, it was a great example for him to pick because it wasn't Christian. It wasn't challenging any preconceived. Most people don't believe in UFOs or, or particularly that UFOs are going to destroy the world. So he had his grad students. I just can't believe this. Like, I wish there was a documentary on it, like of actually like footage or something. So they infiltrated the group before the, the, the date came, the group became increasingly insular. They stopped talking to the press they tried to hide their activities. They didn't want anyone to know what they were up to. Um, and, and the book documents like play by play what they were talking about at what time it goes through, you know, as the date came, the time came, they were like, Oh, the, 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 the leader of the group. Um, I think the pseudonym they used for her was uh, Miriam Kitchen or something like that. She, she, she did an automatic writing thing and she, um, she would she Oh, the aliens have told me that they're postponing it. And then the time would come and go and, oh, the alien. So over the course of like two or three days, finally, you know, they went out to a field and they're ready for it to happen. This is the final time for sure, for real. And it doesn't happen. Now you'd think this would be it. The jig would be up. Now, some people did leave the group. The ones that had invested less, the ones that were less close to the inner circle, they did leave the group. But the ones that were in the inner circle, they doubled down. All of a sudden they're picking up the phone and they're calling the media. Can we get an interview now? <laughs> now the media is not interested whatsoever. They didn't convert anybody after that. They weren't successful, but they tried. They sure tried. And so um, Festinger managed to um, back up his uh, hypothesis with evidence. Um, and so we ask ourselves, you know, how Joseph Smith had some failed prophecies. The Jehovah's Witnesses had failed prophecies. All of these sort of middle American, you know, middle uh, 19th century American groups had all of these very specific prophecies that didn't come true. How could those groups get as popular as they did? Well, that's the answer. I mean, it's actually how it works. Yeah. And if I'm thinking about Mormonism, whether it's, you know, Joseph Smith saying that that Zion or the New Jerusalem will be built in. Uh, you know, Independence, Missouri, and that and that fails, or mm -hmm. or that the end, you know, that 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 the coming of Jesus Christ is just around the corner. After all, we are the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, mm -hmm. and yet we're a couple hundred years into the Restoration, and Jesus still hasn't come. Or or the, even the teaching that polygamy is a requirement for exaltation, and then of course they're rolling back polygamy. Right. Um, there are all sorts of instances in Mormonism where where prophecies just flat out didn't come true and every time you think the members would just uh would just cave and say okay this church isn't true they're making it up as they go along but as you said if the cognitions are deeply held which in mormonism they are if the believers take it irreversible actions like serving it to your mission like okay. um marrying in the temple okay. like making solemn covenants to give your entire life to the church and the the beliefs, you know, did an angel appear? Did did God appear to Joseph? I guess there's no way to disprove whether or not an angel, or or God or Jesus appeared to Joseph. So those things are disprovable. And of course, we have very very significant social ties: our parents, our siblings, our children, our our ward networks, our friends. That's going to be a super powerful binding influence, such that when information comes to us that's disconfirming the truthfulness of the church, right. we're going to have strong motivations to do what I've often called the backfire effect, which others call the backfire effect, like you said, which is to double down and even believe stronger right. in, in the things that don't tie with reality. Like the DNA evidence, which is pretty incontroversial, disconfirming, you know, information It's very very evidence, very accepted science. There's nothing right. questionable about it. And yeah. yeah, you see people double down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So briefly on this one, I go into this more in my book, but there are a couple of biases that have to do with this. And um, just quickly listing Cialdini's six um, influence mechanics. So confirmation bias is a lot like cognitive dissonance. It's basically an instinctive subconscious bias that we all have, everyone, to... Um, ignore things that don't fit our worldview and to accept things that do. Um, and the bias bias is our tendency to believe that I am not biased. I recognize that other people are biased, but I am not. And we all, everyone um, has these to one degree or another. Um, and Cialdini's Six Influence, this is from his book called um, Influence. It has a subtitle and I don't remember it right now. Um, but reciprocation, that's the idea that we 
tend to want to give back to people who we perceive have given to us. And I said that very specifically. We just have to perceive they've given something to us. They don't actually have to give us something. We could have a whole conversation about how the atonement is a thing that supposedly we're given, but are, are we really? Um, commit? Go ahead. Uh, he, yeah, he, in the book, he, you know, if, if any of you ever wondered why, like at Olive Garden, they give you a couple little mints um, with the bill, with the check. And it's based on this type of research that if someone gives you something, then you feel beholden to them subconsciously. Mm -hmm. And they've they've done studies that if 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 you give a little treat with the check, the people are gonna pay more in their tip than if they didn't receive a small little gift. Now that's an example of an actual gift, but it's a small one. Right. But that's why, that's why, um, you know, uh, the, who are the, the airport people that hand out the flyers? Uh, the um, oh, Hare Krishnas, groups. the Hare yeah, Krishnas, yeah, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. They give you a flower or, or Mormon missionaries give a book right. as a gift because psychologically that makes you more likely to then feel beholden to them to listen to a one hour presentation mm -hmm. um, or to buy another book if you've been given one as a gift. And that's a, this is a great book. So I'm really glad you're bringing it up. Yeah, definitely. And then yeah. commitment and consistency, we tend to, and this is again, part of cognitive dissonance. If we make a commitment, we tend to stick to it and we want to stay consistent in our behaviors and beliefs. And this um, is why, this is why missionaries are taught the commitment pattern. Missionaries mm -hmm. are pressured to give investigators commitments to get baptized because once they've made a commitment, they're more likely to follow through. So commitments are super important in, um, and, and door to door salesmen use these types of techniques as well as a way to gain undue influence. And a small commitment can lead to a big one too. And I actually have a, I don't think it's in today's presentation, but I pu public commitment is one of the mind control techniques. We'll do a whole couple of slides on. Um, that, 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 so like, like bearing like a, an altar call in an evangelical church or mm -hmm. bearing your testimony in the Mormon yep. church. If yep. you can get youth or adults to publicly express their their commitments, then they're going to be more um, bound or more uh, likely to maintain yeah. their commitment. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, social proof is our tendency to think that other people know more than we do. Uh, specifically, if there's a whole bunch of people, um, and this one's really a great shortcut because when you show up for a concert and you're not sure where the entrance is and you're in those giant parking lot and you see a whole bunch of people headed that way, um, usually you're right to follow the crowd. Um, but sometimes you're wrong. And in fact, social proof has been um, cited as probably the reason for the bystander effect. It's not that nobody cares that someone's being mugged um, and they're just bystanders who don't want to be involved. It's usually that they think someone else is in charge. They think someone else is taking care of it. And when they see no one else is taking action, um, then they don't take action themselves. And by the way, if you, if you need trouble, if you need help and you're in public, um, the, you know, you're, you're having a heart attack or something. The best way to get help is to point to a specific person, doesn't matter who, and say, help me or call 911, give them an instruction. And all of a sudden everyone will swarm in and help you. Yeah. Uh, or or you say, Hey, point. you, Hey, you in the red shirt or Hey, you in the blue uh -huh. dress, right? Even if you can add some sort of descriptive that identifies them, if you don't know their name, they're going to be way more likely to help you. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and is it is it social proof like Steve Young is a Mormon or the Osmonds are a Mormon? It's uh -huh. basically appeal to authority or appeal to popularity. Is that a form of social proof? It is. Yeah. Like millions yeah. of people can't be wrong. Um, right. The, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So liking is another one. If we like people, we tend to believe them. We tend to go with what they say. Uh, salespeople use that one a lot um, to get people and Mormons are very likable. For sure. And this is the Book of Mormon musical. It's got these cheery, happy, smiley Mormon missionaries that are clean cut with white shirts. It, 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 all the Mormon ad campaigns were, oh, it's a families. Isn't it about time? Like, like liking and niceness is a strategy and, and it's a really important strategy. If you make nice people, good families, that becomes its own missionary tool. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah. we all tend to obey authority. Um, Anarchists uh, excluded, of course, um, but even anarchists, we, there, there's a subconscious tendency when we see someone who appears to be in, and again, appears as a chosen word there, appears to be in a position of authority. Um, Cialdini's book talks a lot about experiments where all you need is a lab coat and a clipboard. 
or what looks to be maybe a security or police officer's uniform. And you can get people to do anything you want. That's, you just tell them what to do and you're wearing a uniform. They'll just go along with it. Um, and then scarcity mentality. If we have a feeling that something is scarce, um, we'll have a tendency to want it all the more. Um, and the, Cialdini actually uses a Mormon example in his book in this one. Um, he talked about the time he was invited. I think it was the Arizona temple. One of the Arizona temples was being dedicated was before it was dedicated. And there were tours and he saw some ads or friends of his were like, you need to go because you can't get inside after this. And he found himself going, yeah, yeah. And here he's a guy who researches the stuff. He knows it. And he still says, yeah, I need to get in there before they close it off. And then he realized, wait, that's what's happening to me. Um, so. And this is why all these websites, uh, you know, say only four left or only five left to purchase. Mm -hmm. Now this goes back to the Ron Paul Peel order now, and you'll receive this other, other thing. But if you don't order now, you won't get the special, you won't get the sale. That's all totally contrived manufactured scarcity to then make you feel an extra, um, sense of motivation to mm -hmm. comply with, with what's being uh, asked you're called you. but fewer chosen <laughs> <laughs> right yeah yeah that's that's a good one uh, the path is narrow and few there be that find it right mm -hmm. yeah yep. yeah and, and frankly the whole atonement theology we will get to this later is a scarcity mentality mm -hmm. it's basically saying oh no you're in debt you're in debt because of the mistakes you make mm -hmm. and if you if you don't have a savior to save you, then you're going to hell. That's creating an, an immediate deficit just by being born. And, and reciprocity. then it's, it, what's that? And reciprocity as well is coming into play there. I, the, the, because the of the gift, right? For me, so I have to give everything that I have to make up for that. Yeah, this is kind of mind blowing when people think about it, because honestly, I don't, I don't think we're saying that Mormon church leaders got together and studied mm -hmm. the six principles of undue influence nope. and then apply, you know, came up with the doctrine and the theology or that leaders now are even thinking in these terms. But these terms really do explain how Mormonism gets such a hold on its people. And again, really these are do. natural mechanisms and, um, you know, kind of going a little bit in the weeds here, but um, when you study narcissistic behavior, narcissistic personality disorder, behavior patterns, um, I am an abuse survivor from a narcissist who, um, it, when you've lived through that, you, and you start to see other people and what they're saying about those patterns, you start to just like, whoa. And then like, I'm starting to see it in, in Mormonism and all of these patterns that we're talking about are used by narcissists as well. And these go back to the dawn of time. The, these are just people that are, they're raised a certain way and, and uh, probably a trauma response. Um, I, we can theorize forever about that. Probably a trauma response. Uh, it's a way to control their world and decrease their anxiety. And it's just, this is what works. As children, they did certain things to get, and they got what they wanted. And they did other things and they didn't get what they wanted. And they learned what worked. And that's what they went with. This is all very natural, uh, behavioralistic kind of stuff. And um, I believe that Joseph Smith was a narcissist. He fits all the patterns. And most cult leaders are either psychopaths or narcissists, um, generally leaning towards the narcissist side. I think the difference, uh, a lot of the difference has to do with how much adoration you need. Um, I don't think a psychopath necessarily needs adoration, but a narcissist does. Again, I'm an armchair psychologist, by the way. Um, <laughs> So take all of this with a grain of salt, but um, I think that narcissists, they need adoration and the ones that start cults, they need more adoration than a family can provide. And so they just start getting more and more and more followers again, completely natural. And what's, what's difficult is I think we all enjoy positive feedback on one <laughs> level or another. So it's very easy to diagnose yeah. anyone you don't like as being a narcissist. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's probably it. a matter of degree, right? Yeah, it's not that they want it. It's that they absolutely need it. And their world is going to come crashing in if they don't. Um, th there's a very yeah. big difference between just kind of like liking it and enjoying attention, um, which nothing wrong with enjoying attention. So super normal. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Next that book by Cialdini is is life changing. Yeah. So everybody needs to go read that book at some point. It's really good. Yeah. Yeah. Next slide. Okay, so now we've got the, the Baskin Robbins, the 31 flavors of uh, uh, the 31 techniques of mind control. 
Mm -hmm. You call it the 31 flavors of coercion. I love this. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it just happened to be 31 when I organized them all. Again, I think I'm the first researcher in this field to actually just put them all in one place. Um, and the six we're going to cover today are in um, maroon or whatever that red color is. Um, so we're going to cover sacred science, demand for purity, doctrine over self, black and white thinking, blame reversal, and guilt and shame. Not necessarily in those order, in that order. Okay. Do you want to just tell us really quickly how you came up with these 31 flavors of coercion? Most of them were named in previous by re previous researchers. Um, Lifton started sort of categorizing it. He had eight criteria of, um, I forget what he called them, eight criteria of a thought reform or totalist um, system. Um, and so he came up with uh, several of them. Um, and then other researchers added, started adding to that. Um, and then again, sort of piecemeal, like in one paper over here talks about one thing and in one book over there, it talks about two or three of the other ones. And then some of them, um, were patterns that were described, but not named. Um, for instance, blame reversal came up a lot. It was often called blame the victim, um, or other, just sort of the, I saw there was a dynamic there. Um, and so I was like, well, it needs, it needs a name and it needs to be a better name than blame the victim. So, um, some of them I did in fact, just name, but I, again, I didn't. I didn't actually invent any of these. So, And are they grouped or ordered in any meaningful way? Or is, are we just talking, to, are they just kind of random oh, as we talk about bit. them, as we talk about them? I did put thought into ordering them in my book. Um, and then I, I did sort of group them for this presentation in ways that sort of things that kind of fit together a little bit. They all fit together in some way. And there's uh, some slides coming up. that will talk about sort of how they fit together. Um, but the ones that are closest. So for instance, demand for purity, doctrine over self, uh, blame reversal, guilt and shame, and also double bind, which is not in this cluster um, are all very closely linked. Like they need each other in order for, for them to work. Okay. Yeah. All right, so we're going to go through one through six, and then in in, mm -hmm. in presentations four through uh, two through five, mm -hmm. we'll cover the other thirty, uh, the, the other uh, twenty five. Is that right? Correct. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. Yeah. Let's jump in. Okay. So this is sort of the overall the, the bird's eye view of what a person. Again, this is assuming this is assuming that the person wasn't born in the church. There's some shortcuts when someone was born into one of these groups, but if if you're trying to get a new convert, this is what they have to go through, the over, overall process from beginning to end of being in the church. So the first thing you have to do, um, often called love bombing, is you have to provide them um, interest. And you do that usually via love or friendship, but also through ideals and values. Um, we're going to change the world and we're going to change you. We're going to make you a better person. And we're going to make you happy. So that's the sort of the hook. Then you have to destabilize them. So this is where cognitive dissonance comes into play. Cognitive dissonance, they've already got their beliefs. Their wall is up. And so to get them to, to change, you've got to tear that wall down. I think I spend some slides in, an, in another presentation sort of talking way more about destabilization. Then you have to establish trust. Okay, we're the ones that are going to put you back together. So you've fallen apart. We, we're not going to say we made you fall apart, but you've fallen apart. Or, or, or like um, missionaries, they they look for those golden converts, the ones that have already had a disaster in their life. They're already um, have lost a loved one or something, and they're already looking for answers. And so then you say we're the ones that you're going to trust. So trust us, and we'll take care of you. Then you need to transmit the doctrines, and that's that's how we're going to get all these mind control techniques into you, um, is through doctrines. And then part of that, and we're going to talk more about this today, we're going to install a pseudo personality, a personality that is partly you and partly the group. Then we're going to create dependence so that you can't go anywhere. You don't feel like you can go anywhere. You feel stuck. Then we're going to isolate you. We're going to put you what they call Malou control. We're going to put you in a box so that you can't um, look to other places for answers. You can't um, receive disconfirming information from outside of your group. You don't know who Thomas Murphy is, for instance. Um, then we're going to instill emotions. And this is really like the instinctive, the gut reaction. You're not thinking about things anymore. We're going to instill fear, shame, euphoria, and some other emotions. Um, and then we're going to create new logic that resolves dissonance in favor of the group. Then that will, all of this together will prevent you from leaving. And then we move on to proselytizing where you are supposed to tell everyone else this great message that you've heard. Okay. I love this. What are you calling this cycle? This, this, these steps? <laughs> uh, a... Bird's eye view of uh, is... how all of it works together. <laughs> this is like the steps for indoctrination, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is, yeah. And, and all of the mind control techniques, those 31 are embedded in one or more 
of these things. So these are sort of like broader categories that sort of cast a net over how, how they all work together. Okay. So if I'm, if I'm going to just apply that, I really like this. I think this is one of your most important slides I'm going to guess. And it, it I want to have a title so they can refer to it. So, you know, how did my, let's just say my wife's parents, um, you know, they, they joined the church in the seventies. My, my wife's dad is a Yale, um, you know, MD, a Yale doctor. They, my, my mom's, my, my wife's mom was a nurse at the Mayo Clinic. They met, they were raising kids in the DC area and uh, they didn't have a religious tradition at all. They became friends with some Mormons, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's where it begins. They become friends with some Mormons mm -hmm. and and the Mormons, they, they seem happy, they seem friendly, they seem warm. It's like, whoa, these are really cool people. Then they, they get, um, they, they, get introduced to this idea that families are only eternal if they're, you know, if they're sealed together in a Mormon temple. The, the Mormon, as you mentioned, the Washington, D.C. temple was um, being open soon. So there was an open house and you can go through it and you can watch those movies. And all of a sudden this idea of, well, do you want to be together with your family forever? Do you want to see your kids again? Do you want to see your mom again after she's died? That can be a form of destabilization. It makes you feel, or have you committed sins that you haven't repented for? There are just some little movies or, or pamphlets that can be dropped to kind of destabilize you and make you think, or just how am I going to raise healthy, happy, normal children? There are just different little, um, little messages that a missionary or a Mormon friend can drop to all of a sudden make you think and start there's thinking about some of these you. more existential questions. What's yeah, that? It makes you think there's something wrong with you. And advertisers use that same thing too. There's something wrong with you. Deficient. There's and some we're deficiency. Fix you. Yeah. Yeah. And so then they establish trust. The missionaries come, the friends come. It's like, hey, we're here for you. We're going to help you. And so then they introduce you to the missionaries. You have the discussion, discussions where the doctrine is transmitted. Mm -hmm. You start learning the Mormon pseudo personality. Don't drink coffee. Don't drink tea. Don't smoke. Don't drink alcohol. Cut Get your the hair. Of Christ. What's that? Get the countenance of Christ. Countenance of Christ. Be Very smiley. Much a thing. Wear a white shirt. Wear a dress. Don't show your shoulders. You're starting to install the Mormon image, right? Mm -hmm. um, then you create dependence. You need the church. You need them for the ordinances. You need the sacraments so that you can get forgiveness regularly for your sins. You know, um, and you need to start paying your tithing. And of course, if you don't pay your tithing, then all of a sudden you're not able to do some of the other more advanced rituals. You get isolated so that only your friends are Mormons. Um, you really start becoming distant from family members or friends that uh, that aren't Mormon because they start thinking you've joined a cult, which makes you feel like that you know they're offensive and you want to stay away from them. Plus, you've got all these new friends. Plus, your old friends aren't living the lifestyle. They're drinking. They're smoking. They're watching things they shouldn't be watching. So you start isolating yourself, surrounding yourself with Mormons. Then you start getting subjected to the fear and the shame and the euphoria. General Conference, the the Mormon Tabernacle Choir talks about the atonement, pornography. Oh my gosh, masturbation. How do I, you know, oh my gosh, my spouse may cheat on me. Am I going to be able to raise good kids? So all this emotion comes at you. General Conference talks, etc. You learn all the new logic through Mormon apologetics, through indoctrination, so that you basically process everything through the filter of of um, of the Mormon worldview, which pushes away science, which pushes away evidence, progressivism, liberal politics, whatever you have to push away, so that you can reject any information or thoughts that don't jive with the worldview. And then they're all once you're in, and your kids are in, and your spouse is in, and and all your friends are in the circle and your identity's wrapped up in it, then it's much harder to leave and you become a missionary. And what, what's the best way to receive confirmation that your beliefs are right? It's to convert other people. And if you convert other people, that becomes, including your children, that becomes its own reinforcer for you. Do I kind of have that right? Yep, Luna? you sure do. You explained it better than I could. In fact, the okay. next slide, I do have some little examples of, of okay. Mormon. Mormon I love phrases. It. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Let's, so, let's dig in and more. You covered actually a lot more than I do. I mean, it's just a slide. So love and service. 
That's how they That's, get you in. Okay. Be contrite, be humble, be as a little child is how they destabilize you. Again, exam there's tons of examples for each of these. Um, yeah, be as a little child. That's so good, right? Be humble. Very much. And the, because the, as children were unstable, right? We're the not learned yet. The learned are prideful, right? Mm hmm Definitely. Yeah. Yep. And then um what's this establish trust, open be open to the spirit. We have the keys of the priesthood, we're the authorities here. We talk to God, right? We we're nice we, we have a direct communication with God. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and then the indoctrination, new teaching eternal truths, line upon line, precept on precept. Um, and then installing the pseudo uh, personality, you have a mighty change of heart, perfecting the saints program. I don't know if they still have that. Again, I left 20 years ago, oh, 20 years ago. Up. I just let my anniversary, my 20th anniversary just come and go. But anyway, um, perfecting the saints was a program, at least that was around at the time. Yeah. Um, no, that's one of the three missions of the church. Now there might good. be four, but it's, it's oh, certainly okay. there. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, creating defend dependence, rely on the Lord, walk in faith. Um, lean not into thy own understandings. Right. Um, isolating, you seek after these things, you seek only after the uplifting things and praiseworthy things and avoid the appearance of evil. For emotions, there's the wages of sin. For fear, uh, we reprove with sharpness, for shame, and um, have the spirit for euphoria. Um, for the logic, there's all kinds of stuff that helps keep you in, hold to the rod, stay by the tree, stay in the boat, pray fast, and read the scriptures. Um, avoid apostasy. Ap Avoid apostasy for um, don't exit. And, and apostates, right? Yes, definitely. Don't talk yeah. to anyone. And and that's under Malou control, which we'll have slides for um, in one of the next um, uh, presentations. And then um, preach the gospel. Every every member of missionary, right? Yep, absolutely. Yeah, okay. So next slide. We're not going to spend much time on this one. This is, um, this is in my book. Again, it's just another bird's eye view of how all these fit together. So each, each of those ones on the side, there are the specific um, mind control technique and sort of what role they fill, what um, thing they do. So uh, br real briefly, because I don't want to, we could spend all day on this one. Um, so if you want to resolve dissonance in favor of the group, you'll use thought terminating cliches, doctrine over self, and so on. Uh, the carrot that gets people to, to come in and stay in would be euphoria, mystical manipulation, love bombing and elitism and so forth. So that's, um, if people want to just plug in my book real quick. You want to get my book. Um, I might have this on my website. I, I'm not sure. Um, but then you can study that uh, more in depth if you so choose. Yeah. Excellent. And again, on YouTube too, to, to, to stare at it longer. Yeah. And I'll just, I'll just show this book again, recovering agency, um, by, by Luna lifting the veil of Mormon mind control. Mm -hmm. There's also an audio version of the book, correct? There is. Yeah. Um, yeah. BJ Harrison um, was awesome. He um, he's a great reader. I love the work that he did for that. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's uh, that's an important slide for you to dig into more things, but we won't dig into that now. Nope. So let's do some actual mind control techniques. Um, so we're going to cover six now, right? Yep. Sure. Okay. So this is sacred science. This is one of them that was identified by Robert J. Lifton when he was studying um, prisoners of war coming uh, back from Chinese mind control uh, um, prison camps in North Korea in the 50s. And it basically, this is what puts the total in totalism. This is the overarching thing. Um, it accomplishes actually a number of things. So we'll talk about that. It appeals to your ideals. It says this is the system. This is the one. This is what's going to change the world. It merges the mystical with the rational. Um, we'll talk about that in another slide, I think. Um, gives you the answer to everything. This is it. This is, it uh, doesn't matter what problem you have in your life. It's everything. Unlike, say, you go to a doctor and your arm hurts and he gives you pain medication and tells you to stretch. That's a very specific thing. He doesn't say he's going to change your life or find your spouse or um, make you happy or fix your trauma or any of that. It's just, he's fixing the one thing where so sacred science is everything. Um, it plays, pays lip service to reason, freedom, individualism, and all of the other mainstream values that we have, peace and hope. Um, it has to address those. Otherwise people wouldn't want to join. And uh, like I said, it puts the total in totalism. Next slide. Yeah. Okay. Um, for it to be sacred science, it has to be an infallible system, number one. This is the only truth. This is the one, the straight and narrow way. It's the only thing. 
and it has to be universal. It has to apply to everybody. Um, there might be a few exceptions to the universal clause. I think there are some, um, but but many of uh, these totalist groups it is meant for everyone. We want to convert everyone. We want everyone in this. These rules that we're describing applies to everyone. Um, it's not like um, a lot of other programs where it's like, well, this is for you, but if it's not for you, then that's okay. It's like, no, this is for you and definitely for you. Um, number two is its doctrines and leaders are indistinguishable. So the leader speaks for God or uniquely presents scientific laws if it's not a religious thing. Um, so this is like, if I question the leader, I'm questioning God. If I go against the leader, I'm going against God. If I badmouth the group, I'm badmouthing God. Those two have to be connected. Again, if it's not a religious group, that might be a scientific law or a system. Um, and the third thing is because because these are unquestionable things and it's it's one with God, then any expression of questions, doubts, criticisms are not allowed. Yeah, and this is just so. I mean, I to me, this is the core. This is the root of what's problematic about the Mormon Church or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. It claims to be God's one true church on the earth. They they call it the fullness of the gospel, right? Mm -hmm. The plan of salvation. It's universal. It's the path. Um, and you get the sense that it is an infallible system, um, even though they'll admit you're allowed to talk about flaws in the past. You're never allowed to talk about flaws in the present. Mm -hmm. The leaders can't be flawed now, and the and the church can't be flawed now. Um, but but yeah, the doctrines and leaders are indistinguishable, and the leader speaks for God. That I think if I could make one thing illegal, it's that anyone could ever claim that they're speaking for God because it all starts there, and that's how it starts. It's just too much power to give any one individual to allow them to claim that they have some direct divine access to God and they get to speak as God's mouthpiece. That's where all the problems start. Um, and it and doesn't then, make sense to me that God would even do that. The, the being so vast and amazing would think that he, he could communicate to one person and have that person communicate to other people. When, when it, all of us know that anyone can lie, um, it just, it baffles me to this day. Yeah, yeah. And so if your if your church claims to have all the truth and to be the one true path, which ours does, mm -hmm. if the leader claims to speak for God, which ours literally does, mm -hmm. and then if expressions of questions or doubts or criticisms aren't allowed, mm -hmm. look at all the excommunications, look at all the shaming, look at all the the bishops' interviews and and you know, it's just clear that Mormonism just one hundred percent fits and employs sacred science as a means of, of coercion and control. That's just... It, it does. Uh, and I have uh, some uh, LDS yeah. quotes coming up, too, if anyone yeah. is still questioning let's do it. that. Yeah, let's do so it. So this is uh, Lifton again. I love, I love how he says stuff. Um, the assumption here is about sacred science. He's saying the assumption here is not so much that man can be God, but rather man's ideas can be God. Science can be combined with an equally absolute body of moral principles its appeal lies in its seeming unification of the mystical and the logical modes of experience, which can create an extremely intense feeling of truth. Yeah. So, yeah. Have you heard that? Have you heard that saying, what is, what is being right feel like? It feels a lot like being wrong. In other words, when you, when you feel something is right, uh, it feels the same way, whether it actually is right mm -hmm. or wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the next yeah. slide, we actually get to, you know, if anyone's wondering if Mormonism fits any of these, there's a couple of uh, quotes. Um, we, Of course, I memorized this one in uh, seminary, I believe. Uh, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess before him. Yea, even at the last day when all men shall stand to be judged of him, and then shall they confess that he is God. And they shall quake and tremble and shrink beneath the glance of his all-searching eye. And I just sort of tongue-in-cheek, I've got a picture of Sauron's eye there. Yeah. <laughs> For people who aren't watching, I'm also thinking of uh, I am Jesus saying I am the way and the truth and the light. No man cometh unto the Father except by me. The intro to the the Book of Mormon saying it's a perfect book, right? Um, things like that. Yeah, yeah. So the next one has a DNC quote. Um, what I, the Lord, have spoken, I have spoken. Oh, this is the one I memorized in seminary. What I, the Lord, have spoken, I have spoken, and I excuse not myself. And though the heavens and earth shall pass away, my word shall not pass away, but all shall be fulfilled, whether by my own voice or by the voice of my servants. It is the same. In other words, my 
my my my servants speak for me. So whether it's your bishop or your stake president or the prophet, you, you may as well be talking to God, right? Exactly. Yeah. You can't yeah. question them or you're questioning God. Right. Too much power. Um, okay. Yeah. Thomas Monson uh, recently, by the way, when I choose these quotes and my book is full of way more of them to show this, I kind of tried to pick from a, a broad range of times um, that someone alive today probably will have lived through starting, well, me, stuff I've lived through, <laughs> starting with the 70s. A lot of that was based on what was available on the church website. Um, it went back 30 years of the time I was researching the book. So I try to kind of show this is like a pattern. So this is from a 2013 um, qu uh, conference talk. From Thomas S. Monson, there is no need for you or me in this enlightened age when the fullness of the gospel has been restored to sail uncharted seas or to travel unmarked roads in search of truth. A loving Heavenly Father has plotted our course and provided an unfailing guide, even obedience. A knowledge of truth and the answers to our greatest questions come to us as we are obedient to the commandments of the Lord. Yeah, it's basically saying, hey, we've got this. You don't need to worry. Just trust us, follow us, believe in us. And everything's going to be taken care of. Yep. And one more quote. This is going back to the 70s, new era. Um, this one, the logic baffles me, so I might script the words. Um, but this is equating science with the mystical. It goes, uh, again, this is a new era quote. Faith, like science, is based on evidence. It is no more subjective and ignorant of evidence than secular knowledge is objective and unbiased about evidence. Instead of looking away from the facts of the real world, faith is one way, among many others, of looking at the world. Thus, faith need be no less intellectual and well-founded than a scientist's belief about the temporal world, and provided, um, provided the faithful person is pure in heart and is honest and unrationalizing about the evidence he receives." That's basically saying, eh, faith, evidence, it's all the same thing. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll never forget, I had a meeting once with Elder Holland, who who was basically saying, hey, uh, you know, organic evolution and Charles Darwin can be easily reconciled with Mormon belief. Mm -hmm. You know, may, maybe evolution is just the way that God evolved mankind. But what that doesn't jive with is the timeline. Because if you look at the timeline of the Bible— in theory, it puts us back about 6,000 years ago, but but we know that evolution has been going on for billions of years. But yeah. there's this kind of hand-wavy thing that, that religious people can do, which is just to kind of state that that faith and, and, and science are, uh, are can be commingled and harmonized, when in reality, the evidence doesn't really... Uh, doesn't really confirm that. But if you say it enough, convincingly enough, people are just going to buy it and go, okay, I guess evolution can be God's way of evolving mankind. I was actually and really good at meshing science and technology and, and the scriptures when I was in there. And um, I'm actually still really good at it. Like, I, I feel like I'm better at apologists than to actually come up with this and like but the thing is is you can't take the bible literally if you want to do this so the literal adam and eve story figuratively yeah it could work these are the first you know humans who achieved civilization level awareness you could say and that would fit the six thousand year timeline they, they were the, the garden is a metaphor for a state of innocence of being an animal and speech you know adam adam was the one who named all the animals so he's the one who invented speech and so it's a figurative story about the invention of language and um and thus falling from that state of innocence by by learning morality which is another thing that separates us from the apes um you know so i'm, I'm good at explaining that stuff away but you can't take the bible actually literally in order to do it you got to bend things and and go with metaphors so. Yeah. And unfortunately, um, you know, whether it's the Tower of Babel or uh, the, the global flood or all the historical problems with the Bible and the Book of Mormon, mm -hmm. it's just really hard to square the, either any of those books yeah. with with the scientific and the historical record. Yeah, it's not, not impossible. It yeah. But when you when you do that, it, it's it's a, it's usually a matter of confirmation bias where you're ignoring the evidence that's disconfirming. And you're grabbing onto the evidence that's confirming, mm -hmm. but it's but it's um, it, it it doesn't really square. It's a great example of how cognitive uh, you know cognitive Dissonance. dissonance uh -huh. and confirmation bias are employed every yeah, day. Yeah, modifying the cognitions. Yeah, yeah. together. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Okay, so I think I think the Mormon Church gets a, a plus on sacred science. Definitely. All right. What's the second tool? 
So black and white thinking is a way that an organization can offer you a choice without offering you a choice. Um, so I, I used this famous quote, I hear it all the time from George W. Bush, you're either with us or with the terrorists. And um, a false choice, basically. Yeah, it's a false choice. Um, yeah. Every, uh, every nuance is categorized into one or the other. There's no in between good or bad, liberty or death. Um, it, it's all got to go love or hate. God or Satan. God or, God or Satan, Satan, right? Yeah. Uh, heaven or hell. It's all got to go in one or the other. Now we go along with this as human beings because it simplifies everything. It makes it easier for us. Um, in fact, in our, in my own decision process, I noticed that I, but this is my personal choice, not someone else dictating it to me. Like if I'm looking for a new car or somewhere to live, um, I try to reduce down my number of choices by process of elimination as much as I can until I've got down to two or three choices and then I can really compare them much more closely. So it is a shortcut, a mental shortcut, um, but an organization uses this maliciously. It's not self-directed. You're not making those choices. The organization is making them for you. Um, and so let's see, uh, next slide. So it's kind of like, this is a reference to an old game show called Let's Make a Deal, where you had to choose between three different doors. Um, and one door had a new car and the other two had goats. Um, but let's say you choose door number A and the new car is, you know, a Ford or something. I don't know. Fords are probably good now, but it's a piece of crap car. You don't want it. Um, but you kind of have to choose that because you don't want a goat. I mean, goats are hard to take care of. So maybe you don't want what's behind door number one, but door number two and number three are worse. Um, and so that's where we have, again, choosing um, between liberty or captivity. And the picture I show uh, a medieval painting of people climbing a ladder to heaven and demons are trying to pull people off uh, down to help. I'm, 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 uh, I apologize. I'm not understanding the goat and white thinking. I understand the game show concept <laughs> of sometimes, uh, participants are asked to pick between three doors, but yeah, I think it was more of a joke in the, in my original presentation, I actually had it like all written. So I oh, okay. have my timing be all right. And, uh, but it's, it's just a way to limit choices. I mean, maybe what your real oh, choice right, is, right, right, you right. want a new house. Like you don't want any of the things that's under oh. your C. Um, but you you got to choose one of the, one of, and, and really it's, it looks like it's three choices, but really it's two. I mean, one has a treasure in the picture. It shows one has a treasure chest and the other two have goats. Um, but it really is only two choices, even though you think you have three. Right, um, right, right. Yeah. So, so it's, eh, it's creating so the illusion of, of kind of a binary choice that's forced. Correct. Yeah. yeah. The illusion is that you have more choices, but really it's only two. Yeah. Yeah. So in the next slide. And they're very, they're very, they're prescribed. They're very, um, you know, it's very controlled choices to, to the benefit, to the benefit of the person telling you, you only have two choices, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So it accomplishes a number of things for the totalist group. Um, it contributes a feeling of being right. I'm one of the good guys, a self-righteous sort of feeling um, and a feeling of safety along with that. It isolates you from people who think a little differently than you do because, um, well, they've chosen the wrong way. Um, and it closes your mind to influence uh, from outside information. So again, I already talked about this, but in all the nuances are relegated to good versus evil. You can't just look and say, well, this has some trade-offs, there's some benefits to it and some negatives, And but if I choose the other way, there's different benefits and negatives, you're not really allowed to do that. Um, it makes every decision or makes direction very simple. So the leader, all they have to do is say, that's bad. And they don't have to pr produce any evidence. They don't have to say, well, it's bad specifically because of this, this, and this, and show um, the evidence for that. They just have to say, it's bad. Sort of like the quote from from Bush that I had, you're either with us or the terrorists. He, he didn't have to say, okay, here's the reason why my policies are what are good. Um, and here's what my critics are saying and address those things. He just had to say, you're a bad person. Um, and then it also creates a habit of intellectual laziness where you don't really have to think about anything. Um, 
I hope that word isn't too harsh. I, again, I don't want to blame any person for taking these things on. I think that they were coerced onto us, um, but it does create a system where you're not really willing to think that that muscle, that muscle of I'm going to really dwell on this. I'm going to research it a little bit. I'm going to consider all the angles. That muscle starts to relax and atrophy and, um, and, and you're not used to using it. So you, you do stop using it in a lot of ways and just listen and follow the direction of the person who's directing you. Yeah, when I'm thinking about this, I think of the the Book of Mormon teaching about the great the great Church of the Lamb of God or whatever, and then the great and abominable Church. Uh-huh. And you know that this is this is what's in the Book of Mormon. This is how I was raised. You're it's either the Church of God or the Church of Satan. Um, and of course, it feels good to be one of the good guys. Um, and and if you just think about the type of language we're allowed to use within a Mormon context, you can't get up and bear your testimony and say things mm-hmm. like, hey, I, I know the Book of Mormon has good things and it has bad things. Mm-hmm. I know the Mormon prophet, sometimes he gets it right and sometimes he gets it horribly wrong. Right. You know, I, I, I know this church is good and bad. You know, try, just try and use that type of language regularly within a Mormon church context. And eventually you're going to get yourself isolated and marginalized mm-hmm. in, in, let's just say, many or most situations yeah. because what what is reassuring to the membership is this is the one true church with authority that God's leading it and as soon as it starts getting watered down it starts losing what's compelling about it right right and I've seen those a couple of those testimony meetings where they shut someone's mic off um, I can't remember the specific examples and I don't spend a lot of time in the ex-Mormon world anymore, but I have come across those where I think one was someone was coming out, like a teenager was coming out as being gay and uh, they cut her mic off in the middle of it. It's like, absolutely yeah, not an yeah. option. Yeah. And what you definitely can't do is get up and say, well, here's the things I like about the church and here's the things I hate about the church or here are the ways the prophet gets it right, but here's the way the prophet gets it wrong. You start talking about that, you're going to be eventually escorted off the premises if you do that long enough. And for anyone who hasn't experienced a group where you are allowed to say those things, there are groups out there where you are allowed to say, you know, hey, I really like this place, but there's a couple things that are wrong with it. Um, Can we deal with that? Um, All kinds of groups of all kinds of interest areas that do that. Yeah. So it is possible. Yeah. Yep, the, it is next, possible. Yeah, the next slide is we're going to get into some quotes here about what the church just to prove it, to show the evidence that the church really does do this. Um, Delbert L. Stapley in the incident in 1975 said, there is no middle road. Our position must be one of strength in order to overcome the evil that Satan would have us do. Next slide. Wherefore, oh, this is from Nephi, second Nephi, wherefore men are free according to the flesh and call things call things give are given them. I think I mistyped that, um, which are expedient unto man and they are free to choose liberty and eternal life through the great mediator of all men or to choose captivity and death according to the captivity and power of the devil. For he seeketh that all men might be miserable like unto himself. Next slide. those Those are the basic choices. Those are. Yeah. Okay. Little punchline there. (laughs) <laughs> he chose poorly, it says. <laughs> and a- another movie reference that came to mind while I was um, thinking about this morning uh, is in an interview with a vampire, which is, is a great movie. Um, it's rated R, though. Um, and <laughs> the, the vampire Lestat is, um, has just drained Louis, the human, of all of his blood. And this is the point at which um, he's either going to die or become a vampire. And Lestat says to him, I'll give you the choice I never had. And, and that's the power of that moment. He doesn't have a choice. He's either going to die or he's going to become an undead. And that's, that's the only thing uh, that he has. So that's another example of that situation. I also love the, uh, the South Park clip where it shows everybody in hell and there's a guy with a clipboard and he's saying, welcome to hell, everybody. And then, and then the, and then somebody speaks up, Hey, wait a minute. I'm in the wrong place. I, I did everything that I should have been doing. And the guy's like, well, which church? Which church were you? And he's like, "Oh, I, I was I was a Methodist." And he's like, "Sorry, you picked the wrong church," uh-huh. you know. And and same with the Presbyterian and the Lutheran, and and in that case, it was the Mormon church that was the right answer. But I think it was satire. I think. Yes, and I've got a Mormon <laughs> joke to do with that, but I don't want to take too long. <laughs> Shh, don't tell the Mormons; they think they're the only ones here. That's the punchline to that one. Right? Yeah, um, I've heard that before. <laughs> So um, here's some antidotes to black and white thinking. First of all, the world is an infinite spectrum of rainbows and everything in between. It's not just even a range of grays. It's everything. 
Um, and, and the uh, LGBT reference here is not accidental. Um, and think about things in terms of trade-offs. Uh, things, some things are, you know, everything comes with a price. Everything has what you're willing to take about it and what you, what you are willing to not take about it. Um, and you try to mitigate those as you can. Every choice is like that. Um, and just because something bad happens to you because you made a choice, that's just one of the trade-offs. It's one of the risks that you took. It doesn't mean um, that Satan is out to get you or that God is punishing you. Each person has a right to their own experiences. Everyone. Um, Mormons who have great experiences in the temple have a right to that experience, but so do Mormons who had bad experiences in the temple. Everyone has a right, especially to their subjective experiences, what's meaningful and personal to them. Um, I think that that's sacred and I try to respect that as much as I can, as long as the person isn't using that to harm other people. That's when I get my wrinkles up um, when people start getting hurt by their behavior or their words. Absolutely. Um, it, unnecessarily hurt, I would say. Sometimes you got to say things that are just, you know, going to hurt. That's It's a nuance. There's, again, it's a nuance. There's a lot of moral, you know, um, nuances there um, that you have to navigate. Um, you just have to do your best. Um, capital truth versus small t truth. Um, we have objective truths versus subjective truths, and we'll discuss that a little bit more in part three. It sort of really helps, you know, um, this, this iPhone is real. It's, it's, you know, it's solid. It's a, a real object. We can all agree that it exists. That's an objective truth. A subjective truth is, um, I don't really like milk chocolate. I, I love dark chocolate. I love it. I'll eat it all the time. And I don't like milk chocolate. And that's me. That's mine. Um, other people, my mom really loves milk chocolate. Um, and so I respect that. And when I buy her chocolates, um, for, you know, her mother's day or whatever, oh, crap, that's coming up. Um, <laughs> I try to uh, buy her milk chocolate because I know she won't eat the dark chocolate. So um, we can respect each other's subjective differences. Um, right. And and we can make room, make space for that, for other people's truth. And we don't have to invalidate. I don't have to feel bad that my mom likes milk chocolate. That's not a reflection on me at all. Um, F. Scott Fitzgerald has a famous quote. The test of a first rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. So that kind of addresses that. I can, I can, even with objective stuff, I can see your point. Like I may not still agree with it, but I can make space for that in my head. Yeah. And, and this is also this is so very Mormon. Mormonism really does encourage black and white thinking and, you know, as as neo apologists like Tarot Givens or Patrick Mason or others are now emerging, trying to move Mormonism into this middle ground of a mm -hmm. multicolor spectrum. Uh, the the problem is the value proposition because if if we're if the church is all true, and if the prophets are literally speaking to God, well, that's that's good to know and that's really valuable. If the prophets get it wrong as often as they get it right, if 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 God's will is often tainted through that glass we're seeing through darkly, and if half the time the revelation is actually ends up being just social pressure, then the value proposition of Mormonism becomes a lot less uh, compelling, I think. Mm -hmm. And and that's kind of what we're dealing with. We have a really good comment from one of our listeners, Akeem. He writes, um, and I think you would agree with this. Akeem writes, same cult-like tendencies in politics, mm -hmm. especially in the two-party system. And he lists Republicans and Democrats, which, mm -hmm. which I agree with. I think Republicans and Democrats can be can, can engage in black and white thinking, totalistic kind of ideologies that leave little room for nuance. And I, exactly. I'm going to be the first to condemn. I just hate partisanship personally. I hate exactly. dog, dogmatic Republicans and dogmatic Democrats. And I, it I benefits, don't... it benefits those in power. Um, and that's where, um, you know, I, I don't want to get too much in politics. I, I lean, yeah, left. I don't either. <laughs> I lean left, but I, I don't always agree with what my party, the party, I mean, yeah. that's, you know, so yeah. Absolutely. So yes, this applies to MLMs, multi-level marketing organizations, mm -hmm. family systems. It can apply to any real type of organization, corporations. And yeah, there have been true. smaller political parties that were full blown, like what you would think of as, you know, branch Davidians, like insular, um, very, you know, a particular leader who is, has always been the leader who is very abusive. Um, I've read about a couple of those and, uh, yeah, that, that's also a thing. Activism groups, same thing. Any anything. I love yeah. it. Okay, so I think I think the Mormon Church gets an A plus on black and white thinking. I do think that they're trying to change that, but I think what we find is that churches 
that that go more towards a spectrum way of thinking end up becoming weaker and dying. And yeah, so the church is having to choose between staying strong and rigid and potentially breaking and becoming more flexible but dying slowly. It's it's a tough See, choice I'd get, to make. I'd get rebaptized if they take me as I am without trying to change who I am. Um but but the thing is like I wouldn't pay tithing. <laughs> I might right. give them a donation every once in a while if I thought they yeah. were actually using it for building, you know, digging wells or feeding people. Um, yeah. But, but I wouldn't, and I wouldn't go to church every week. I mean, I've got the Unitarians. I could go to them and I don't, I've got the, um, the, it's the restored church where they call them now community of Christ, I think. Yeah. Um, and I, I could go there and I, I don't want to get up on Sunday. So yeah, it's, I would join and I would be a number in their ranks and I would talk about them, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't be very active. So yeah, yeah that's the problem. All right, A, A plus on uh, black and white thinking. Third point is doctrine over self. Let's see if the church meets criteria. All right, so doctrine of, over self is the idea that um, the, the doctrine has to be far more important than each individual. The group has to win over individual preferences and whims. And this leads uh, everyone in the group to sort of congregate towards a specific personality that's been established as the group uh, as being the ideal personality. Um, and that elevates doctrine over individual. It, this helps accomplish stifling of thoughts and feelings, your own personal inner, I still call it the still small voice. I don't believe it's an external spirit, but your own subconscious, your own gut feeling, your yearnings, you have to stuff them down if they don't comply um, with the church. And that's everything from doctrinal things like don't drink coffee, don't um, watch rated R movies um, and, and sort of the big stuff on down to the stuff that they're not very specific on, but there are certain things that are frowned upon, you know, like when I was a teenager and was thinking about going into music and some people around me were like, well, I don't know the music scene. There's a lot of sinners and wickedness in that field. So maybe you should kind of just stay away from that. It wasn't a commandment or anything, but, but it influenced me and it did get me to sort of stuff down some of those um, talents. And also there's certain ways that talents are to be expressed. You know, if you, if you want to play a hymn or play an uplifting piano piece at church, that's fine. But you want to get out a guitar and play rock music or even on the piano and play rock music. Well, that's hold up, you know, hold up. So it's very, even in our creative endeavors, there's a very narrow um, definition of what's okay and what isn't. And so we end up conforming ourselves and contorting ourselves into that narrow basket. Absolutely. And um, it also resolves all dissonance in favor of the group. Or tries to. <laughs> right. it, yes, it attempts to. Not all of us yeah. got past that. <laughs> So okay. does the church actually do this? Well, let's see. Um, how does it do it? So Messiah, uh, I think I also memorized this one in seminary. For the natural man is an enemy to God and has been from the fall of Adam and will be forever and ever unless he yields to the enticings of the Holy Spirit and putteth off the natural man and becometh a saint through the atonement of Christ the Lord and becometh as a child, submissive, meek, humble, patient, full of love, willing to submit to all things which the Lord seeth fit to inflict upon him, even as a child doth submit to his father. And I have a picture of a sad little boy here, and it's coming coming out of a history of abuse. I, I, I look at that and I just like, I'm, I'm appalled by it now. Um, this domineering, very, you know, the child must submit. There's no um, conversation there. There's no empathy. There's no connection or love or leading with with love. It's about submission. Um, and it's about contorting our inner child, making, contorting ourselves, you know, we're, you're an enemy. God hates you unless you come around and then, then you'll be all right. Yeah. Yeah. It's just this idea that if you don't do everything God says, you'll be in, in Satan's power and thrust mm -hmm. to hell. What type of parent sets up a system like that? Right. Yeah. It's the, the, the oh, older oh, baby. I get. Yeah. The older I get and the more I learn about abuse dynamics, it just, uh, it starts to turn my stomach after a while. Um, that even 10 years ago, I've been out of the church 20 years, even 10 years ago, I was still kind of like, yeah, that's just the thing. But now I'm just all like, whoa, patriarchy and dominance and um, abuse dynamics and trauma bonding and all of that it just it starts to authoritarianism. Yeah. Yeah. So the next one is, uh, this isn't a scripture or anything. This is a quote from a memoir that I found online by someone. I'm probably going to mangle her name, Pam Casimir. 
Um, she wrote it called Losing My Mind Bit by Bit. I don't know if this is still online. It was when I wrote the book. Um, she tells her harrowing tale uh, of her exit story, which ended her up in a, a suicide hospital. Um, and she says, I lost my identity. I lost all sense of who I was as an individual with a right to sleep, pleasure, fun, joy. Being a Mormon dehumanized me. I was just a worker bee like in that beehive thing they use as their symbol. Rather than rest, I plodded on. Just be a good pioneer woman. I was obedient to every rule. There had been so little time over the years for myself. I had forgotten I was even there at all. Mm. It's a hair. Oh, it's making me want to cry. Just thinking about her story. Just ugh. anyway. Um, so that kind of shows what our experience is of it. And then a couple more quotes. Dallin H. Oaks from 2014 conference. Beware of the slick package and glitz of a good time. What the devil portrays as fun can be spiritually fatal. By the way, you'll notice the other mind control techniques coming in here. So it's, it's using black and white thinking to create doctrine over self. Um, and then George Orwell, um, 1984, thought crime does not entail death. Thought crime is death. Um, now the next slide before you go on, trigger, trigger warning. Oh, you went on. <laughs> Oh, sorry. It, it does contain uh, images of death. And um, I present this um, to kind of show the cost of, you can go, go on now. Just, oh, wait, wait, wait. if you have small children or, um, or are sensitive to these kind of things, you might want to turn the video off for this part. Um, so now you can go up. Um, just wanted to warn people. Um, when you hear about cults committing horrible atrocities, it's doctrine over self that they're employing. Um, mass murder, suicide. Um, this is this is how they're li literally able to get people to give up their lives for the organization. Yourself is worth so little that um, these. This is a photo of um, from Jonestown in 1978, where um, over 900 people were. I'm going to say massacred. Um, people often call it a mass suicide, but um, I, I firmly believe that these people were coerced and manipulated into doing this, even though each one took uh, the Kool-Aid with the cyanide in it. Um, this is actually flavor aid. Um, they, they took it willingly. It wasn't really willingly. Uh, I've listened to, um, they're available online, the death tape, uh, the death tapes where they actually have the recording of Jim Jones talking to his followers and convincing them to do all of this. And you can listen to him. And what's really creepy about this is how much he sounds like a general authority. His voice is very calm. He's got an elderly, um, he almost even has the Mormon accent. He's a very kind, gentle voice, but he's telling parents to force their children. <laughs> Sorry. So that's, uh, I didn't expect to get emotional about that because I've talked about this before, but um, we can move on from that. That's the stakes of doctrine over self is, you know, it, it convinces people to commit atrocities against themselves or others because the doctrine is that much important. Um, yeah, yeah, and it is emotional. And and Luna, I appreciate your vulnerability there. If it's okay, I'm just going to go back really quickly mm -hmm. to this doctrine over self. I I think one of the most compelling examples is the the LGBT example. You know, um, when I, when I was talking with Mike Rinder and Leah Remini about Scientology. There, there were several people that were offended that we would ever compare ourselves to Scientology because, after all, Scientologists put people in prison. Scient you know, there's, there's members of Scientology that are missing. They do physical beatings. Um, you know, they're, they, they're very litigious, and they'll, you know, hire someone to buy a house across the street and harass you. Like, yes, of course, Scientology can be much more brutal and overtly mean-spirited and and abusive than the Mormon church. Mm -hmm. But but there's a strategy to that and, and I call it nice cult or a benign cult or a friendly cult and there's a strategy. But that doesn't mean that these principles aren't in play mm -hmm. and that they aren't even deadly or more deadly. So no we're not poisoning people and having them commit a mass uh, suicide, for example. No, no, we're not physically killing people intentionally, but let's just take the LGBTQ identity. If you are taught mm -hmm. that your core uh, attractions, who you love, who you're attracted to in the case of sexual attraction, or if you're taught that your gender identity is wrong, that the gender that you were assigned at birth doesn't align with the gender that you feel inside. Mm -hmm. You're taught that that's sinful, that that's wrong, that um, 
and that those attractions or, or that gender identity is in effect evil and mm -hmm. that the only way that it's going to be fixed ultimately is in the next life. Mm -hmm. um, you have to literally die to have your gender corrected or your sexual attractions corrected. What we all know now that's led to is within the Mormon church, thousands and thousands and thousands of people who died by suicide in epidemic proportions over the past 30, 40 years within Mormonism, mm -hmm. because these people were asked to suppress and deny their core feelings or their gender identity um, and subjugate it to the church's, you know, 19, you know, Cold War era teachings and principles around sexuality and gender identity. And so no, the church isn't administering the poison, but it's almost more insidious because they're, they're administering the poison through thought control and without ever administering any physical poison, it's leading to uh, a larger number of deaths or family dissolutions or, you know, divorces in the case of mixed orientation marriages that end in divorce. And that's just the LGBTQ example. If you're science minded and you feel like science should trump religion, but the religion has sold to you um, its absolutist view of, of truth and of a worldview that is incompatible with science. Again, you have to choose between the church's doctrine, Joseph Fielding Smith doctrine, or science, or you risk getting kicked out of the church. Or if you're a woman and you want to work and you don't want to have kids, you're constantly bombarded with this message that the woman's place is in the home, that there's no greater thing than the woman nurturing the children as she stays home with the husband working. These are all ideologies um, that teach doctrine over self that right. lead to anxiety, depression, divorce, family or marginalization, and sometimes death by suicide. And, and in some cases, many, many, many more deaths and many, many, many more broken families than a smaller, more extreme religion like Scientology could ever manufacture. And right. so in some ways, the niceness becomes, in the end, more dangerous and more fatal. Do you think I'm overselling that, Luna? I don't. And I also think how many people died crossing the plains. And once they got there, the theocracy that they were under um, with Brigham Young, where they literally feared for their lives um, and their, I'm not big on Mormon history, but I, I dabbled in it just slightly, you know, and I, I have read some of the accounts of, of mysterious deaths that were thought to have been blood atonement killings. Um, people who tried to escape in, you know, their journals and um, were either brought back or killed. I think of the Ma Mountain Meadow Meadows Massacre. Um, you know, especially in the early church, there are actually direct comparisons um, between those events and modern cults. Absolutely. So uh, as, as troubling as it may be for anyone, anyone who knows the excommunication of Natasha Helfer Parker or me or Jeremy Runnels or Kate Kelly or the September 6th or Grant Palmer, you know, just the list goes on and on. If you disagree with the church's doctrine, you're fired, you're excommunicated. Mm -hmm. And no one can doubt that. So unfortunately, the Mormon church gets an A-plus in doctrine over self. Yep. Demand for purity. I think we're going to have a similar grade here. Um, I think that in terms of the thought for form techniques that I've identified, this one is um, they get A-plus with extra credit. Um, demand for purity isn't just, you know, it's healthy to have a want to be a better person, maybe join a program that will try to make you a better person in whatever area, you know, I have a therapist. Um, that's okay. What this is, is a whole other level. This is a demand for flawless perfection. It's not a request. It's not a suggestion. It is a demand. You have to be striving for perfection for demand for perfection demand for purity. Again, I didn't write these criteria. This is other researchers um, who came up with this while studying other groups, um, high demand groups. Um, and the increasing list of demands, first of all, it seems to layer on top of each other. And then it takes up a huge portion of your life. This isn't like if you joined um, a bicycling club or an, a gym and you have a personal trainer and they're there and you got to keep going, you know, no pain, no gain. And they're just, and, but that's about getting buff. 
um, or being a good cyclist or winning a competition. That's only about that. It may affect like your diet because it's to do with your body and your exercise program. But then the rest of your life is up to you. Um, this is about taking over your whole entire life with these various demands that you have. The de this is an important part. The demands have to seem achievable, but are actually impossible. And it creates in each person a system of per perpetual inadequacy. You always feel like you're not enough. Um, next slide. Yeah. Yep. I'm sure this is resonating. Yeah. Um, so it reminds me of Cinderella in that story where she was told she could go to the ball if she did this rather large list of things. She did the large list of things and she still couldn't go to the ball. And the fact is that she was never supposed to go to the ball in the first place. It was never the wicked stepmother and sisters never intended for Cinderella to go to the ball. Um, and that is a, an abuse dynamic that shows up also in domestic, all of these things show up in domestic abuse, by the way, to one degree or another. Um, it's very similar to that. So uh, next slide. Perpetual inadequacy. In fact, if uh, it's demand for purity in the literature, if I had named it, I would have called it perpetual inadequacy because I think that that's just as big a part of this dynamic as any other part of it. Um, first of all, it appeals to your sense of ideals. Um, it says, we're going to change the world. We're going to make you a better person. And it makes the group look good. We're going to help all these people. We're going to save everyone. And number two, it instills a sense of unquestioning obedience. So this leader has the all the answers, sacred science, um, and I have to follow their program or else I won't accomplish the goals that I've set out to, to do, like, like get to the celestial kingdom. Number three is purity applies to thought, not just action. So it can literally stifle doubt. Um, and Mormon Church does this a lot. It, um, you know, you're not allowed to even think a bad thought. You're not allowed to doubt anything because even that will violate your purity. Number four, keeps the individual too busy and exhausted to complain or notice flaws in the organization. So you're working so hard to do this list, which you never see all at the same time. You only see whatever the general conference is talking about that particular week or the Sunday school class that particular week. And so you think, oh, yeah, I can pray that I can do that. And then the next week it's genealogy. Oh, I can do that. But, but you can't. And so you're always feeling like you're a little bit behind and you're always working and striving and you get so exhausted that plus you're raising a family and you have a career and you're doing all these things. At the end of the day, you're just too tired to even think about any of it. Number five, it provides an explanation for any unfulfilled promises made by the group. So um, we'll probably get into this a little bit more uh, later on, but the group says, Hey, you'll be happy. This is wickedness. Never was happiness. This is a program for happiness. This is God's way is the way. And when that promise isn't fulfilled, well, now they have an out. You must not have done it right. You weren't doing it right. You were doing it wrong. Exactly. And number yeah. six, which leads into number six, which is it sets the individual up for the traps of blame reversal and double bind, which are both other thought reform techniques. We'll cover blame reversal today. Um, and it places the member in endless mode. So there is always, you're always flawed. You're, you'll never, they don't tell you you're always, well, they kind of, it depends on what week. There's a lot of double speak. It depends on which Sunday school class you're in that week. But, you know, it's, you, you can achieve perfection. It's a commandment. God gave it to you. You may be, not be in this life, but maybe in the next, but sometime you can. But then the actual feeling that you feel all the time is that you are actually flawed. And so you always have to keep coming back to the group for redemption. Yeah. Some people get frustrated that, that I, that I ask so many of my guests about masturbation and pornography, but I, I don't, I do it for only one reason. I, I, I've said before recently that shame and guilt and usually sexual shame and guilt is sort of core is a core ingredient in the Mormon formula for kind of the, the hamster wheel of worthiness, because you need people thinking they need Jesus and the atonement and thus their Bishop and the church so that they can be in good standing. And you have to pick a ubiquitous or a universal transgression or sin that that can that can make sure that across the board, members are feeling inadequate and unworthy. Well, what's more ubiquitous than yeah. masturbation, um, especially with men, but definitely with women as well. And so that's why you will not see the church remove porn and masturbation from its emphasis on the or youth. Because or, or fornication or sexuality, right? Any type of like, um, I'm, I'm polyamorous. So that's totally out. Um, it, all of that is completely out. And you're absolutely right. It is about something that we all have that we don't 
it's not like food. Like you absolutely have to have food or you are very evidently very quickly dead. Um, sex is something that we need. We definitely very much need it, but it can, you can live without it. You, you can actually survive without sex. And so it gives them a way to, and it's not just, it's, it's, it's not just our external behaviors that they're controlling. They're controlling your emotions and they're controlling your thoughts and they get in there. And if they can do that, if they can control your thoughts and emotions about something that we all need, like, well, not all of us, asexual people do exist, but that most of us need, then they can control your thoughts about anything and your emotions about anything. That's sort of the proof in the pudding that they really, really have you. Yeah. And so you, you, you have to, you can't swear, mm -hmm. you can't, you can't have any type of sexual relations with anybody, you know, um, you, you have to, uh, you can't drink beer. You can't do any drugs. You can't drink coffee or tea. All of these, you can't even have bad thoughts. Right. Right. And all of these sort of rules and guidelines, not only propel this nice squeaky clean Mormon identity image, that's important to luring people to the faith, but it also makes all the members constantly feel inadequate so that they have to get the hamster wheel of paying and praying and obeying um, so that they can stay bound to the church so that the church has power and influence over them. That's right. And that's then the church the becomes the only source of, you know, maybe fleeting joy sometimes, depending on who you are and whether it fits well or not. Um, it becomes your, your only source. So if you had a competing source of joy, you know, you smoke weed a little, every once in a while or something like that, then, um, then you're like, Oh, this is fine. I'm fine. Everything's fine. I don't need to go to church if, to get that little, that yeah. little fleeting so the church. Joy condemns anything that would compete with it in terms of euphoria, for example. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So next slide. All right. Oh have my goodness. Ever, this slide's you, overwhelming. Yeah. Have you ever seen a list of all the LDS commandments <laughs> in one place before? So for those who are listening, this is probably 50, 60, 70 commandments all in this huge PowerPoint slide in four columns. That's virtually unreadable, right? <laughs> it, it is. You're not meant to read this. <laughs> um, I do have a list in my book and I also have one on my website. Um, I did, I went out, I, I uh, listed all the ones I could think of. And then I went on a forum. I think it was postmormon.org at the time. Uh, the, uh, rest in peace. Uh, I miss that website a lot. And um, it, it's a list of, I came up with everything I could possibly think of all in one place. You'll notice that the church has never released this in a pamphlet, in a scripture, in a conference talk, in a Sunday school class. I have never once seen a list of every single commandment. Now, when I join a program where I have a goal that I want to accomplish, I often get lists. Like, you need to do these things. Like, as a writer, here's some things that, here's some tips that you can do to become a better writer. And sometimes I get those in like a form. Like, here's here's some of the suggestions that you could do to be a writer. And it's got a list of things. Well, that's because if I want to accomplish, or if I have a personal goal I want to accomplish, I'll start writing a list. I'll make, I need to do this first and this first and this first. That's the thing you're never meant to complete the list. Um, if they showed you all of those commandments in one place, you would be, you would freak out and you would run away and you'd be like, I don't want anything to do with this. I can't do it. You have to be under the illusion that it's possible to do. Otherwise you can't feel inadequate. That's where the, the feeling of inadequacy comes from. And that's key to this particular technique. And a Mormon missionary is never going to show this list to investigators because it would scare them away. And that's why there's a problem of informed consent mm -hmm. because people aren't really thinking about you know, the fact that this is this massive commitment, they're just, it's, it's sort of dribbled out rule by rule without a real understanding of what the totalistic commitment actually ends up being. Exactly. So yeah. let's see, am, am I just blowing smoke or does the church actually teach these things? Let's yeah, see. The slide. A, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Doctrine and Covenants 82.3. Nevertheless, there are those among you who have sinned exceedingly. Yea, even all of you have sinned. But verily I say unto you, beware from henceforth and refrain from sin, lest sore judgments fall upon your heads. For of him unto whom much is given, much is required. And he who sins against the greater light shall receive the greater condemnation. And to the side is a Mormon ad. Um, it's from the 80s. Uh, I don't, do they still have Mormon ads? I don't know. I, when I was a teenager, uh, that was the thing. You get the new era and everyone had a new Mormon ad in it. And so this one's got someone washing their hands. They're very, very grimy. And it says strong soap at the top. And the caption reads, but it feels so good to be clean. Yeah. Yeah. Not to mention, don't show your shoulders and dress modestly and, you know, all, all dress those things. Dress has to go down to the knees was how it was when I was in church. Yeah. You had to yeah, kneel. So the, 
the stake yeah. present. It made you kneel to see if your dress touched the, which is so gross. Anyway, um, Purity uh, culture, purity culture. Exactly, exactly. Um, here's another one. Uh, Matthew 5, 48. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. And Abraham 3, 25. And we will prove them herewith to see if they will do all things whatsoever the Lord their God shall command them. And there's a, a cartoon that I included. I don't know who to credit this from. Uh, I just found it on Google. Um, a guy is wearing um, a ring around his waist, and he has a pole that goes up and there's a ring dangling from that. And um, he's trying to reach for it and he can't because whenever he jumps up, he, he goes up too. And the, um, the other guy who's ordering him around says, keep going higher, jump higher. You can do it. Grab the ring. And he can't, he can never grab the ring. So. Right. Very good. Next slide. We have um, the miracle of forgiveness. The, the problematic book of all time. Um, Spencer W. Kimball says, Every sin is against God, for it tends to frustrate the program and purpose of the Almighty. Likewise, every sin is committed against the sinner, for it limits his progress and curtails his development. In our journey toward eternal life, purity must be our constant aim. To walk and talk with God, to serve with God, to follow his example and become as God, we must attain perfection. In his presence, there can be no guile, no wickedness, no transgression." Yeah, it's this infinite standard that is just completely unattainable by design. I mean, it needs mm -hmm. to be unattainable or you get off the hamster wheel, which right. with the only exception of that is the is the second second anointing, which is right. problematic in and of itself because it's associated with money and family connections and elite power. And by then you're in so deep. I mean, there's only been like one or two people that have defected and 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 that, come to tell about of. it. Yeah. Um, by then you're in too deep to to get out. And that's kind of part of a lot of of these high demand groups, they sort of have these circles, you know, and, and when you're out on the edge, it's easier to leave and the closer in towards the middle you get, you know, so for me, when I left, I was a single parent. So I didn't have family connections. My child was under the age of, of seven, of eight. He had not been baptized. I, um, I had friends outside the church that I'd met in college and through the internet. Um, and so I had uh, a place to go. Um, I had a much better social network outside the church than I did because I never, I'm autistic. I didn't really ever kind of fit in. It was hard for me to make friends within the church. Um, so it was easy for me to, to leave. I, I kind of was, as, even though I was raised in the church, was a little bit on the edges. Um, but I, I really feel for people who are married and have six kids, like I, I don't, I don't think I, if, if I found Mr. Right, like I was desperately seeking in my twenties, um, I'm really grateful that I never did. Because if I would have, I, I very well could still be in the church or have, have led a much um, more difficult life. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, let's see. Last slide, slide on, yeah, on demand on for purity. One. Yeah. Um, this is actually from a study that was done at UVU uh, by Christine Dottie, PhD. Um, she uh, studied uh, a thousand students. Um, and she found that there was a connection between depression and perfectionism. Now, in her work, she blamed it on um, the culture. She did not draw those lines back to the leadership. Um, but uh, as we've seen, I fully think it was, I don't think this is just people thinking it up and saying, hey, let's all demand for purity just because it's fun. I think this really did come from the top down all the way back to Joseph Smith. And before him, the previous uh, Christian traditions that, that he was influenced by. Um, and the quote here is that the results suggest that there is a culture of perfectionism related to depression found at UVU. Aspects of perfectionism found included internally imposed standards, externally imposed standards, and a high need for organization and competency. In addition, a person's perception of their spirituality or religious beliefs and experiences also played a role. Again, she's she's probably saying it's their perception of it, but I fully believe that it was. And her work is really good. I think she did a couple of studies um, that I cited, or, or UVU itself did. Um, in my book, I have a whole part on mental health and um, uh, what the research was available at the time. I think there's a lot more available now. I wrote the book in 2014, so um, so what was available there. So that kind of shows that there is a cost to this. There is a um, there was another study that they did that sh showed that. Um, women were more likely to be depressive and have mental health issues like suicidal thoughts or um, uh, eating disorder type. Mormon, Mormon women, right? Yeah. Mormon women after yeah. uh, on Sundays, 
like the ER just accepts that they're going to be accepting a bunch of Mormon women on Sundays for mental health issues um, after church, coincidentally. Yeah. There's one point I wanted to make on a slide earlier. Mm -hmm. You've got kind of this demand for purity and for perfection. You've got this big list of commandments. What what's worth mentioning there, and I don't know if it's on this slide, but I think the granddaddy of them all is the law of of consecration, right? Mm -hmm. It's the fact that when you enter the Mormon temple, you you covenant to give all of everything, your time, your your money, your resources. And if I remember right, when I went through the temple, it said even your own lives, if necessary, mm -hmm. to the building and the strengthening of the kingdom of God. And so the commitment is total. It's not just these commandments. You're 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 committing to give everything, including your lives, if necessary, for the kingdom of God. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So demand for purity, purity culture, and and basically total commitment. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. Well, I think I think the church. I, I hate to say it, but I think that the Mormon Church gets an A plus for per, for purity culture. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's, uh, so far it's all a pluses. So let's see if yeah. maybe blame reversal, uh, the church gets, uh, less, less stellar marks. All right. So, uh, this one and, uh, demand for purity are kind of holding hands They're They kind of go together. So, uh, and I kind of mentioned this a little bit when, when the church makes lofty promises and they don't come true, it's got to blame someone. So the church makes, uh, makes these big sacred science and mystical manipulation promises. Um, this is sacred. This is special. You're blessed to be born in this time. Um, and wickedness never was happiness. And you, we're going to give you the wonderful life. Following the gospel is going to give you a wonderful life. Um, and But because those promises will fail, inevitably, that will cause cognitive dissonance. And so they have to resolve that somehow. So they, what they do is they say, well, that's all your fault. It's all your fault that you didn't accomplish these goals. And it's all your fault that you're unhappy. Uh, and this is actually a really common um, abuse dynamic. Um, there's a an abbreviation. I never remember everything it stands for. DARVO, which stands for deny. Oh, I can remember it. Deny, attack, reverse victim and offender. So uh, what you're doing is, is you're blaming the victim for this abusive system that's been set up for them to fail in to begin with. Um, it reinforces the illusion of choice. So you think you're choosing to follow this path, but really it's, you think you're choosing to aim yourself at these goals, but the goals aren't actually achievable. And that motivates you to work all the harder, um, which, you, you know, your nose is to the grindstone and you're not able to look up and look around you and go, wait a minute, maybe this is all BS. And that all leads into the double bind and shame, which we'll cover shame today and uh, double bind another time. Yeah, a couple of, I know we're going to, there are a couple more quotes, but a couple of examples that come to my mind here, you know, some of the most uh, fiercely serving, obedient, hardworking missionaries are gay and lesbian Mormons that were promised, if you serve the most faithful mission that you can, Heavenly Father will take your same-sex attraction from you. And they become, in so many instances, the APs on the mission because they're working so hard. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, the more they try, the more they try, it never goes away. And just like Zion's camp, if you guys remember Zion's camp where Joseph Smith predicted that they were going to march down to Missouri and, you know, beat the Missourians because the Missourians were being mean. And of course they went down there and the Missouri militias beat back us. Well, what did Joseph Smith do? He blamed the, the members of the militia and said, well, you guys weren't faithful enough. You always have to bring the blame back um, back to the member because the system can't ever be wrong. It can't be that Joseph Smith made a false prophecy. It can't be that the church is just harming a bunch of people. And so the the gay Mormon, the lesbian Mormon, the bisexual Mormon, the transgender Mormon, the, the, the Mormon male or female who can't stop masturbating, you're doing it wrong. You're not doing it enough. You're not righteous enough. Keep trying. And again, that makes for great great members or great faithful missionaries until people just burn out and either implode their mental health implodes, their anxiety, their depression gets to them of the woman, the, the hamster wheel of female perfectionism. Mm -hmm. You got to be the best mom. You got to be the best wife you can. Right. You got to be, you know, the, the, the leader of the home. And it, it's just a toxic recipe 
for self-destruction, for over overuse of prescription medications, <clears throat> for addictions to opiates, you know, within Utah, and and of course depression and even uh, death by suicide. And it's always it's always the members' fault. You're never doing enough. It's never the church's fault. For example, having a deadly LGBTQ policy, that can't be the church's fault. Blame it on the altitude. Blame it on, you know, the members. Blame it on society. Blame it on video games. Blame it on Hollywood and the toxic media. It can never be the church's fault. Yeah. And the one that came to mind there, too, when you were talking about women is um, raise, raise up your children the way that they should go and they shall never depart from it. Well, the implied thing there is that if your child does depart from it, then you screwed up as a parent. You didn't do it right. And that one's kind of heartbreaking, you know, seeing that dynamic within my own family. So, um, yeah, it's it's always your fault. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's that's so difficult. OK, some quotes. All right. So this is from General Conference, uh, Gordon B. Hinckley in 1984. A woman wrote to me a short while ago with a great sense of frustration. She indicated that she had been defeated or had failed in most of what she had tried to do. She then asked, what does God expect of me? So that sort of reveals our instincts um, as Mormons to, uh, to turn that blame inward, um, which I feel we've been groomed or conditioned to do. Delbert L. Stapley in 1975, Ensign, uh, I think this was also a conference talk, said, every dispensation of the gospel since the beginning of time has come to a close, not because God has failed, but because man has failed God by the improper use of his free agency. And if you remember from sacred science, by God, he means the prophet, and by the prophet, he means God. Those are interchangeable terms. So it's not that the church and the prophet has failed, it's that you all have failed. It's all your fault that even the world is coming to an end. I just can't emphasize enough this idea of original sin of sin, just the idea of sin. It is, we view it as, you know, we're all conditioned to think, oh, well, sin. Yeah, we make mistakes. So we sin. That's a great teaching because we all need to stop making mistakes and we need Jesus and the gospel and the atonement. So yeah, sin. What we don't understand is it's just that initial teaching of the idea of sin. Mm -hmm that that hooks right. us all in if it were if life were just like oh no there's learning if if we were all just taught as children no 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 there's no such thing as sin mm -hmm. there's no even such you know it all it is is you learn and right. when you learn better you do better right well that's that's a very positive model that we could all get behind and when a kid does something that hurts someone you just say hey Hey, what you did just hurt someone. Let me teach you why you shouldn't hurt somebody mm -hmm. and how you can act differently. And look, then you'll do better. That's a healthy, productive system, but that's not how religions operate. Religions need a deficit model and a sin model. And that's why even the teaching of sin or original sin and even the teaching of the need for an atonement, we all have positive feelings about Jesus but it's actually the atonement is actually an insidious doctrine because it's all based on a deficit model of your brokenness and right. you needing someone to to make you clean and to make you whole. Right. And and, and that's, that's complicated exactly. because we we always think positive things about the idea of sin or of Jesus, but these teachings can actually be very insidious. They can, yeah. And and another thing too is like there's a difference between a sin model and a values model. Like having values is is very self directed. Um, you know, my value system is very much about don't hurt people. Like that's the thing. And there's nuances there as to what that means. And I think about that really hard and I try to live and I sometimes I accidentally do it. And, um, I, but I try to live by a model of just, you know, um, as the Wiccan creed goes and it harm none do as ye will. Um, and so I've built my model around that. The, these things, uh, the church said they were bad, but they're, they don't actually, you know, like hurt anybody. So, um, or there might be, they might hurt a little bit, like I'm drinking some coffee here. So there's some, maybe some health trade-offs or some positives and some negatives there. Um, my choice to drink coffee. And so I'm, I'm with free agency, with full awareness, at least to the point that modern science has at this point, I can go and research that choice that I'm making and make the, the closest thing and take on the risk that I'm willing to take on to get the benefits that I'm getting from each choice that I'm making. I would caution people. I mean, it's tricky business because someone might just decide, well, my value system is I can just take what I want when I want it and go out and hurt people whenever I want. And I, I don't agree with that, but I think I think that there are reasons that I can explain why you shouldn't act that way that are self-interest based reasons. And I think that 
also like that's a very different thing from like you were saying it's sin it's it's the inherent fall of man it's you you know good versus evil and and there's either good or there's evil and that's all there is to it and and if you're if you're going with the evil path you're a sinner and we're all sinners and i mean that whole thing is just a whole different conversation than an evaluation of your value system and then trying to live by those values as closely as you can that's an accomplishable goal by the way right i love it and that takes us to uh, Brene Brown and the teachings Thanks. about shame, which religions yeah. also rely upon. Yeah, and I didn't quote a whole lot of, uh, I didn't quote any uh, cult people in this. I think I do in my book, Cult Researchers, because um, I think we all know what shame is a little bit, but we kind of don't. So my chapter in my book is guilt okay, and shame. Okay, wait, wait. Is this a new, is this a new concept? Uh, it's, I mean, it's guilt and shame, right? Is this but one of the you, 31? Is this one of the it, 31? It yeah, it is. It's one of the oh, okay. Things. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. So let me just go back for just one second then. I'll finish off blame reversal. So blame reversal where if, if there's ever a question, if you do what the church says huh? and it doesn't work out, it's always, you're doing it wrong. Can we, right. is there any of us who are doubting whether or not that's wedded to Mormonism? It is, it is, it's a plus. Yeah. It, I don't so know that the church has ever like apologized for anything. No, they, they right? literally they literally have said we don't apologize. Yeah, like admitted fault for anything. And isn't that what, by the way, speaking of sin and value systems, isn't that what we're supposed to do? We're, we're supposed to like as part of the repentance process, we're supposed to notice that we've done something wrong, and then we're supposed to make amends, and yeah. we're supposed to go to the bishop and confess that. But the leaders never seem to be part of that process. And the higher up the chain you go, the less part of that process you are. And the organization itself never has a moment where they live by their own doctrine, which is that they should apologize and make amends and repent for things. They never do it. That's because the church is infallible. Yeah. And in fact, they're explicitly on record as saying we do not offer apologies. So yeah, yeah, that's a big alarm. Someday the church is going to have to fix that because, but as long as Down H. Oaks is still alive, they can't, they're stuck with it. So mm -hmm. that's a big problem. Okay. So uh, now we're to the last of the, of the six points we're covering today, which is shame. Okay. Now jump in. Let's jump in sure to shame. Yeah. And in my book, I actually, the chapter is guilt and shame. Um, those are two related concepts, but they're very different. And today I'm focusing on shame because um, shame is pretty useless. And we'll talk about that. Guilt actually has, it's a, it's a reasonable emotion. It's um, got a use. That's where I've, val I've violated my values. And now I feel bad about a person that I've hurt. And um, that motivates me to have a behavior different, to, to change my behavior um, and to make it right. Um, so guilt is, is definitely abused by the church, but really Shame is the one that, in my opinion, shame has very few functional uses other than to manipulate and hurt people. So Brene Brown is a um, social psychologist and a researcher. I think I got her title right there. Um, and she's done she, a number she's, of... Uh, she's actually a social worker, not a social, social psychologist. Worker. Got yeah, it, got yeah. it. Um, and she she's done a number of TED Talks and written a number of books and um, uh, at least at the time had some great videos on her website as well. Um, and she's researched shame in, in a great deal. So a couple of the differences of shame um, is one is she says, shame is a focus on self. Guilt is a focus on behavior. Shame is I am bad. Guilt is I did something bad. You can't fix broken. If if I'm a bad person deep down inside, like that's my inherent nature, which is what the feeling of shame tells us. There's not there's nothing I can do to change that. I, and I can try. I can feel like I can change it. I can try. But the next day, I'm just going to feel like a bad and broken person again. So there's no restoration that can occur there. Whereas guilt is I did something bad. Well, that's an action. That's actionable. I can I can change my behavior in the future. I can make amends. I can do restitution for that action. Um, that is something that is external to me and I can do something about it. She also said, shame is easily understood as the fear of disconnection. Is there something about me that if other people know it or see it, that means I won't be worthy of connection? And that's the thing is shame is a social emotion. I can feel guilt about something and no one else. It has nothing to do with anyone else. Shame absolutely has everything to do with what other people think of me. So 
I can even feel shame about things that aren't, I don't even think are wrong. And I'm a person with social anxiety a lot of the time, by the way. So um, I definitely know what it's like to feel shame when I don't actually think I've done anything wrong. I don't like rationally, I didn't, I, I misspoke or whatever. Nobody's feelings got hurt. I just felt like I felt bumbling and awkward and I'm feeling ashamed. That has nothing to do with what I personally value. It has to do with what I think other people think about me. And that's very much the difference between um, shame and guilt. So I love it. Yeah. Okay. Next, next slide. Yeah. Um, shame makes us feel alone. It makes us feel unacceptable and unlovable. And we tend to hide our true thoughts and feelings as an antidote for that. Um, and we'll get into the next slide. We'll talk about how um, shame isn't actually a good good mechanism for changing behavior. So in addiction circles, um, there's there this dynamic is brought up sometimes in that, you know, there's the cycle of you feel shame. So then you feel self-loathing and then you feel so awful. You feel so awful. So then in addiction circles, you turn to your addiction of choice. So you start drinking again. Well, and the drinking makes you have bad behavior, or maybe you just feel bad because you're drinking again. So you're like, Oh, I'm a terrible person. I can't stop drinking. And the people around you are like, you're a terrible person. You can't stop drinking. And that leads to shame. And that leads to self-loathing. Shame isn't very much about changing a person's attitudes or behavior. You can kind of change people's behavior by shaming them into not doing that thing, but internally, they're still often going to have the same attitudes. So shame to me, isn't usually a very useful function. Um, it can lead to lashing out. It can lead to self-soothing behaviors that are not healthy, like addiction and self-destructive behavior. And it's also very core in the feelings of depression and suicide. Uh, and it's a self-perpetuating cycle. And it just, it, it keeps, when you get stuck in that feedback loop, you just keep going in it. Yeah, it's, it's super damaging. Yeah. So totalist groups actually, uh, they have a purpose for shame. Like personally, you don't, doesn't get much out of it, but a totalist group can use it to control people. Um, it destabilizes the self and helps them promote the doctrine over the self. Um, because again, you feel like a bad person, you're broken, you're perpetually inadequate because you're not meeting the demands for purity. And so then the blame reversal comes in where you're shifting that blame, not on the group that is doing the bad thing to you, but on yourself for having not been a good enough person to have avoided the problem that is coming up. Um, and it also directs negative attention away from the group and back to yourself. Yeah. And so, you know, one example of this is... The constant harping about, for example, porn and masturbation or law of chastity or modesty, then you couple that with the fact that almost everybody's going to fail in one or all of those areas in their normative adolescent upbringing or young adulthood. And then you combine with that the fact that you have to have these bishops interviews where you're deemed worthy. You have to have your temple recommend. You have to be given, you know, permission to pass the sacrament or bless the sacrament or go do your baptisms for the dead or get married in the temple or go on a mission. And these are all mechanisms built into the Mormon church to enforce the purity on the members and the shame culture is built in because what happens if you masturbate and try and go on a mission? It, everyone finds out that you were, your mission was delayed. Or what happens if you have premarital sex before you try and go to the temple wedding? Well, then your, your marriage is delayed or postponed. Or even if you're 12 years old and you confess masturbation, oh, you can't bless the sacrament. So all your buddies in church see that, yeah. that they're all blessing the sacrament or passing the sacrament, but you can't. Or if you're a young you know, teenage girl, well, you know, somebody touches you where they shouldn't have, you confess. Now, all of a sudden, when the sacrament comes to you in church, you have right. to pass it on by to the next person. Right. We yeah, have right. shame, public shame built into our doctrine, our theology, our practices, and our visible church ordinances that, whether it's intentional or, or not, insidiously enforces the purity culture on the members through public shaming. You can't even go to BYU. If you sin, you get kicked out of BYU, sent home from your mission. Um, shame through, you know, enforcement of purity culture through shame is just everywhere within, within Mormon culture. One of my biggest fears as a teenager was that I would be raped. And the biggest fear about that was the shame, just the burning intense, even the thought that that could happen to me just 
it, it wasn't the personal trauma that I would go through or the problems that, that it would cause me as a person. It was how that would reflect on me in the eyes of other people. You know, I'd have to talk to the bishop probably. And um, I couldn't even think about what I would have to do, what that chain of events would be, because it was just such an overwhelming experience of shame. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I love this next slide, that shame is is torture. Explain mm -hmm. Explain that. So this is a study um, that was done that uh, is particularly about social rejection, but I think that's pretty much the same thing as shame. Um, they did a study in F with an fMRI where they put people in the machine and they um, they had people uh, go through pain. They probably used ice water. Um, I don't remember. It's been a while since I read the study, but um, that's what they usually use in these, went to, to simulate pain. And um, they, they scanned the brain and they found these certain spots in the brain where pain was being experienced. And then they had different, the same people on a different day, I think it was, come in and they, they asked them to remember a time when they had been rejected, uh, broken up with, I think was, was part of it. And they found the exact same parts of the brain were lighting up as with pain. And so when, when a group puts us through these shameful experiences, makes us feel ashamed of normal human life functions that we do, they are literally causing us torture in the sense that we're, we're experiencing it the same way we would experience pain. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, this is from Chris, Kristen Weir from the pain of social rejection, um, which is, uh, was in the APA monitor on psych on psychology in April, 2012. Humans have a fundamental need to belong. Just as we have a need for food and water, we also have needs for positive and lasting relationships. And that's just how core it is. I mean, you can look and say, well, the church never beats anyone. They never like, punch anybody. Uh, they never even really say, like, call you names or whatever, other than sinner, you know, but that's okay. Um, and But what we don't realize, you know, they don't starve us. They don't, um, other than Fast Sunday. I mean, I'm finding exceptions, by the way, to all of these. Um but, you know, for the most part, they, they treat people well. And so we tend to want to excuse it. But what we're ignoring here is just how fundamental our need is to be accepted by other people. Um, it's it's just rooted deeply. And there's a condition um, called failure to thrive where infants um, will, if they, they're not getting care and touch, and they, they can have all the food they want. But in the same in monkeys, they did research in the 70s and 60s with monkeys um, all the food and water and every physical need met, but if they didn't have love from a warm physical mother type being, they, they shriveled up and died. They just didn't care and they died off. So this is really serious. This is not some, we can't just dismiss this with a, with a flip of the wrist. This is really serious stuff. Yeah. And this was really brought home to me in my recent conversation with Leah Remini and Mike Rinder. We were talking, you know, ex-Scientologists, we were talking about comparing Mormonism to Scientology or, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses, for example. And, you know, again, I, I, I was kind of doing an analysis and I said, okay, so we don't do hard shunning where it's like, you know, we'll never talk to you again if you leave the church, you know, kind of like with Scientology where someone's labeled a suppressive person and you can never talk to them again. I said, all that we do is you may be cut out of the text chains that a family has. You may not be invited to certain family events. And most importantly, you'll eternally be viewed as a disappointment by your parents right. to the point where you could cure cancer and you would always be viewed as a perpetual disappointment by by your family members. And Leah just made this point, but John, that's, that's horrible. And, and all of a sudden I just realized, you know, that, that really is true because we don't do the hard shunning like Scientologists or Jehovah's witnesses. Then all of a sudden what we do in comparison, we don't even register it mm -hmm. as being comparable to torture. But if you are not invited to family things, if you are cut out of the family text chain, or if just simply you're viewed by everyone around you as um, as a complete disappointment and as a failure, or by your own spouse as a constant continual disappointment, mm -hmm. or you lose all your friends and the ward members and the social connections that you used to have, that really is tantamount to torture. And we, we as Mormons are conditioned to think, oh, well, well, well the Mormon, we don't shun. 
mm-hmm. don't shun in the Mormon church, right. but the truth is we do. And it yeah. is torture and it is diabolical. And if you don't register it as horrible, as abusive, as horrendous, you sort of give everyone a pass for what really is torturous and, and uh, inhumane behavior. Yeah. And it's tempting to minimize it. And that's a thing that, you know, abuse survivors from all types of programs of, of abuse, whether it's spiritual abuse or domestic abuse, um, is, is there is a sort of oppression Olympics, you know, like, and we do it to us. I do it to myself. Um, you know, well, my abuser didn't, you know, do this or didn't do that. So it's not, I'm not, my pain isn't as valid as someone else. And it's the same with these group dynamics, you know, well, my church, you know, wasn't as bad as Scientology or Branch Davidians or Heaven's Gate or whatever. Like we didn't, you know, do any of that stuff, but it's still like your pain is still valid. You're still, the bad things still happen to you. Even if it's lesser of a bad thing than happened to someone else, your pain still happened to you and it still hurts and you still need comfort and you still need validation for that. You still need other people to recognize that that hurt and that that's reasonable to feel hurt by those things because in all honesty, they were intended to hurt you. If you didn't comply with, with the rigid demand for purity that the church laid out, then the church feels that you deserve to be hurt. And it's all throughout their scriptures. God's saying it all the time. You deserve to be literally God shuns people from the celestial kingdom. And it it baffles my mind that I ever thought this was okay. But God is like, well, you didn't live a perfect life in that life where you were behind the veil and you couldn't see anything anyway, but you still didn't live a perfect life. So I don't want you to live with me anymore. How, how is that love? Like there were very few things that my son could do where I would say, yeah, you're banished from my life. and I'm never going to talk to you. God shuns. That's literally how the whole program works. Like even if you're celestial, even if you're terrestrial or telestial material, which we're told are pretty good people, they're just not perfect, but they're pretty good people. That's grounds for God to shun you for all eternity, forever and ever. (laughs) To me, that just, it baffles my mind. Like it's one thing to set boundaries and say person, okay, if you're going to be hurtful to me, if you're going to be abusive and, and do bad behaviors in my presence that are is directly affecting me or the people I love. That's one thing to say, okay, I'm going to need to put some distance between me and you until you figure that out. But that's not what God's doing. He's saying, nope, forever and ever and ever. Yeah. Yeah. And that, um, you know, that, that is abusive and, uh, that's, that's a problem. Yeah. Okay. So you have a summary slide on shame. I do. Yeah. So I think hate the sin, love the sinner seems okay on the surface, but you still, you're still a sinner. I mean, you're, you're still shaming the person you're for, for what you're calling a sin. Um, and, and as you mentioned, LGBT issues, a lot of times those sins are things that are just inherent to who you are. They're not even about your behavior. They're just things that you just are that way. And there's nothing you can do about it or, and you wouldn't want to do anything about it, even if, if there were, cause you're not hurting anybody with that. Um, Unconditional love, by the way, got sort of muddied. It was a loaded term within the Mormon church. Um, Got all kinds of ideas about what that was. But really, unconditional love is acceptance for who you are, not in spite of who you are. The people that I love unconditionally, and there are people I love conditionally, and that's I think that's fine as long as I'm upfront about it and I'm aware of it and stuff like that. But the people I love unconditionally, like I just like them for who they are. Like they're not, maybe their interests aren't exactly in line with mine and Maybe we don't always have things to talk about or some of their behaviors are annoying or whatever like that. But like, I, I'm not seeking to change who they are fundamentally. I'm not, um, again, if there's harmful behaviors, I might just draw some boundaries. Like, please don't do that around me. But, um, but I, I'm still like loving like who they are as a person. So like when it comes to LGBT people, like it's not hate the sin and love the sinner. It's you, you love the person that like, they're a human being. They're not just some sinner. They're a human being. Um, and when you add demand for purity with blame reversal, that's when you get shame. I put up some words here. These are sort of, um, words that have shame baked in with them that Mormons use a lot. And the implied opposite of that, again, black and white thinking there, you only are one or the other. So you can be worthy or unworthy. And what does that actually mean? Like you're worth something or you're not worth something. That's the root of that word. You either be sacred or carnal. Again, no, either blessed or you're you're not blessed. Like there's no in between. You can be pure or unclean um, or you can be perfect or be selfish. 
Um, and we have a lot of those dichotomies within Mormonism of, again, ways you can be, not behaviors, but things to be ashamed about. Like, I am selfish. I am unclean. I am carnal. I am unworthy. And it's hard to change, like, who you actually are. Yeah. So. I love it. This is such a powerful slide. I have a comment from Akim again. Uh, he writes, I guess subtle soft shunning can sometimes even be more emotional damaging than hard shunning because you're still part of the conversation and are constantly reminded of your deficits. And I'll just add, Akeem, that you're also still in contact with your abusers. Mm -hmm. If if soft shunning where you're viewed as, uh, you know, let's just say you're married to a spouse who's a believer who thinks you are a constant disappointment because you are no longer, quote, a righteous priesthood holder, or you're constantly going to the family dinner every Sunday where your entire believing family kind of looks down on you, talks about you behind your back. You're constantly being uh, exposed to what really is abuse because it's abusive to be viewed as a disappointment, to be viewed as a failure, to be viewed as lesser than, that is abusive. And so sometimes a hard shun at least is humane in the fact that you're cut off and you're not, you know, you have to deal with the loss of that person, but at least you're not continually bombarded with reminders of your inadequacy and that you're a constant disappointment. If you're, if you're soft shunned and you're still in contact with your abusers, it's it's more chronic. It's not as severe, but maybe it's more damaging in the end. Um, I think you really could argue that. And mm -hmm. I just love this idea, Luna. And and for me, I think I haven't fully processed my own Mormon, uh, my own Mormonism, my own Mormon conditioning. And I just think it's it's so powerful. I haven't really thought of it before. That the entire concept of heaven is is rooted in shunning that the whole multi levels that we as mormons always sold as a virtue it's like oh we don't have hell we don't have an outer darkness we just have a stratified celestial system that it where shunning and marginalization and ostracization and inferiority is structurally baked into the process where you either get to live exalted with heavenly father for eternity or you're eternally shunned and stuck into an inferior caste where you don't get to be God and get all the, the benefits and the exaltation. That is really insidious. It's basically shunning based heaven, a caste system in heaven. And how horrific is that? But somehow it's all been sold to us as, as kind and gracious and loving. Maybe that's true compared to sort of the hell and the heaven but how is it, how is it not abusive? Right. And that's, and again, the older I get and the more experience I've had with interpersonal abuse and the more I study and recover from my own traumas, uh, just the more like horrific it gets, just the more like the, the less like I can accept the authoritarianism that is baked in. I mean, we're either all equal or we're not. And Mormonism has nothing to do with equality. There's, we're, we're not created equal within Mormonism. Uh, it's it's strata, it's hierarchy, it's you know, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, unfortunately, I think the Mormon church gets an A-plus in shame. Now, we're not the only churches that shame. Obviously, or you know, Jews are famous for guilt and shame, or Orthodox Jews, as I've as I've understood it. Catholics are well known for their guilt and shame. And of course, Scientologists and Jehovah's Witnesses and others, and even, you know, Orthodox Muslims, they're all gonna have their purity culture. And they're all going to have their guilt and shame, but but Mormonism, we we thrive. We're built on shame culture, and so I think the church gets an A plus for shame, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Car Carl says an A plus 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 plus. Mm -hmm. So that's what that's what Carl says. Okay, so Luna. Um, today has been just amazing. We've done six of the thirty-one sort of techniques used to have un undue influence over, over the membership. Um, you do have a book, which is a really good further reading, reading list. Why don't you just read those out really quick? Um, sure. cause these are some really good books for further reading that are worth mentioning. Number one on the list is my book, recovering agency, lifting the veil of Mormon mind control, Luna Lindsay Corbden. The next one is captive hearts, captive minds. I really love this book. It was very empathetic. By Madeline Tobias and John Jalaj, yeah, I don't know if I'm saying it right. 
<laughs> Chandra Lalich. Lalich, yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, and there's a new version of that that I have not read, but I think it's just an updated version of Captive Hearts, Captive Minds called Take Back Your Life. Um, what I like about theirs is they also include domestic abuse dynamics, which in my opinion are pretty much the same thing. Um, Recovery from Cults, which is edited by Michael Langoni, that is a... Um, uh, a, a collection of papers and essays that are um, readable by uh, the the average layperson, um, and I really love. Some of them are about experiences that people have had and exit stories from other groups. Some of them are more clinical leaning or um, research based. Uh, I, I really got a lot out of that book. Um, the Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism by Robert J. Lifton. Again, the classic. I've, yeah, I've, I've really only, I have to admit, I've really only actually fully read that one chapter. I think it's chapter 22. Um, but I, I do own a copy and I flip through it. Um, uh, again, it's older language, so harder to get through, but um, very poetic when you, when you can sort of reach the density of the, of the text. And um, Releasing the Bonds by Stephen Hassan. So these are some of the top uh, books that I liked the best. Um, I, liked, I liked a lot of books, but had to limit it down. Um, and then the next slide isn't really meant for. Consumption. Oh, really, really, really quick. If it's okay, sure. I'm just going to mention, um, you know, there there is also by Stephen Hassan, right. um, co combating co cult mind control, which is a classic. Right. I highly recommend that. And uh, there, there's another one called Freedom of Mind, helping loved ones leave controlling people, cults, and beliefs. Yeah. So this one is about understanding how cults work. It's got the bite model in it, behavior, information, thoughts. Basically, as I as I understand it, Hassan felt like L Lifton was just too technical, too scientific, too hard to read. Right. And so he basically acknowledges Lifton but builds on Lifton and condenses it into a more readable format. Um, and then this is about helping loved ones see that they might be experiencing undue influence. That's that's freedom of mind. And I'm going to add to this recovering agency. You've already mentioned it. This is a this is a you you want to understand Mormonism within the frame of these intellectual greats. You got to get recovering agency. And so I'm just going to ask all my listeners right now, please go buy this book right now. Go to Amazon, buy this book, support Luna, Lindsay Corbden. They deserve your support. This is, this is the best way. Do it for yourself. If you want to deprogram, if you find yourself stuck in the, the discourse of Mormonism, Stuck being able to move on, stuck being unable to heal, stuck in unhealthy patterns. It might mean you haven't done the work to really understand the hold that this conditioning, that the Mormon conditioning has on you. And that doesn't mean you have to leave the church. There are plenty of listeners that love the church, that want to stay in it. This has nothing to do with whether you stay, stay or leave the church. Um, you know, remain, retain your membership, even attend. This is about... Um, freeing your mind, freeing your mind from the conditioning that you were were raised with. And whether or not you leave the church or resign from the church, that's a totally different question than whether you free your mind from the unhealthy conditioning. Is that fair to say, Luna? I think that's fair to say. Yeah, absolutely. And and you can fully stay in the church and read this book. I mean, it'll generate a lot of doubts for sure, and you'll have to, to deal with that. But I um, I mean, the, the purpose, I mean, if the church wanted to use my book as a guide for how to be less abusive, um, I would totally. We'd all be thrilled. That. We'd not, all be thrilled. Yeah. 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 I totally. All, yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. Thank you for the shout out. Um, that's awesome. <laughs> Everyone go buy this book. And if you do, it will reward our thinkers and our writers for their amazing contributions. And, and then, and then you can buy it for loved ones, buy it for friends and family um, it, we just, we need to support our thinkers and our writers and our artists. And Luna has done an amazing job here. If you can't tell just by today, how much thought they have put into, uh, their work, um, you know, you will, when you read this book. So please buy this book right now, go on Amazon. I get no personal monetary, uh, kickback from this recommendation. Go buy this book right now. Uh, for your for to thank Luna for their work, but also to help you uncondition, uh, re reprogram, recondition your mind from the unhealthy programming.
Yeah. And and there's an audio version as well. There so is. Ivana writes, is there an audio version? Yes, there is an audio version. How do they get it, Luna? How do they get the audio version? Uh, it's on Audible or I think Amazon and Audible are the same thing now. So I, I think you can get them through this same channel. Yeah. So And there's also ebook. So physical print and uh, ebook as well. And then, of and course, Google. you've got a, a big old slide with like... Yes. Dozens and dozens of references. That's just my references. So if you want to hit pause and screenshot that, I know it's really tiny. Um, but uh, that's and my book, of course, I have a thousand more than a thousand footnotes in my book. So um, if you want any of these references or sources, I wanted to make sure I've actually been hoping someone will try to pick apart my work. I've been looking for criticism like a other. I mean, I get the kind of criticism of you just hate the church and Satan has hold your part. Like, no, I want like I would love, by the way, I put out this challenge out there. I would love for someone who is pro Mormon, who thinks the church is a great thing and not abusive. I would love them to try to pick apart my book because I've been waiting for that. I've been waiting for someone to, to take me down and um, criticize it with like a thoughtful criticism. Um, and uh, no one's done it. I've had some people say they would. <laughs> no one did it. So um, that's one of the reasons why I cited it so heavily. I wanted I wanted my arguments to be impeccable. Um, I'm sure I made mistakes, though. And so I'm just putting that out there. Yeah. Well, yeah. So so believers or defenders of the faith, if you want to take shots at, at this presentation, go to the comments at mormonstories.org, comment on this blog post. Feel free to make comments in our YouTube when, when this is released on YouTube or here on Facebook. You can email us. Uh, if people want to get a hold of you, Luna, how, how do people get a hold of you? I'm most active on Twitter. Um, so I'm at Corbden on Twitter, C-O-R-B-D-E-N. Um, if you follow me, expect a lot of politics. Um, my politics will become very clear to you when you do. Um, I do a lot of retweeting, but I also, uh, all of my other interests, I end up, I was just talking about a video game the other day, and I'm also a, a part-time little bedroom DJ, what they call a bedroom DJ on Twitch, so you'll get all kinds of random stuff on there. Um, and um, my email address is Luna, L-U-N-A, at Corbden, C-O-R-B-D-E-N.com. That's B as in boy, D as in David, in that order. Um, those are the two best ways to reach out. I also have sort of a Facebook presence, but I'm never really on there. Um, you can just search my name on there. Um, where else am I? Those are the best ways. Huge shout out to Sid Olson. Sid writes, looking forward to reading Luna's book. Thanks, John and Luna. Excellent podcast. And Ivana writes, bought the audio version via Amazon. Thank so thank you, Ivana, for purchasing. <laughs> and I, I hope that all of our listeners purchase this amazing book, not just copies for themselves, but for their friends as well. Okay. So Luna, what do, what do our listeners have in store? Because this is just part one. So let's give people an overview of what's to come. Just part one. Let me glance at my other ones. I think the next one will be covering love bombing, destabilization, deception, belief follows behavior, public commitment, creating dependency and emotion over intellect. And um, then the rest of the 31 will, will be breaking down in the three. So fall. basically from now, this is part one. And for the remaining four episodes, we'll be covering around five or six of the 31 issues per episode. Is that right? Yeah. I think the next one is where I crammed seven because there was an odd number. So two, right. four, six. So there's seven in the next one. Um, and then the rest should all have six. So. Yeah. And, and I promise you guys, this is, this will help you process your Mormonism and it will help you heal and grow. And someday I think we need to have like, uh, like retreats or workshops where we can bring people in, identify these principles, have them do assignments, uh, in session and, and help them process and talk about and share and exchange the ways that all these principles apply to them. Because I think yeah. this can be its own mental health intervention, I believe, to help someone uh, reprogram. Yeah, we'll do um, that. Yeah. Yeah, talk let's, let's talk about that. A couple yeah. more comments. Shannon Funk writes, you're helping me see how much I gaslit myself in the church and invalidated my own feelings and how damaging it was. Yes, Shannon, that is one of the benefits to Luna's work. And of course, the amazing Jonathan Streeter uh, writes, Luna is I fantastic. <laughs> I learned so much doing commentary with Luna in the Undue Influence in General Conference series. So glad to see a focus on Luna's work here. And I want to give 
give a shout out. Jonathan Streeter has one of the best and most important YouTube channels called Thoughts on Things and Stuff or TOTUS. And yes, he he is another person along with Randy Bell and uh, and Anthony Miller and Natasha Helfer who all brought to me your work as super highly recommended. So Streeter, we love you. Keep up the great work. And do you want to talk really quickly about what you did with Jonathan Streeter on thoughts and things and stuff? Sure. Yeah, we've done a handful of these and um, we'll probably do more in the future. Basically what we do is we um, together, we watch a general conference talk and we pause like literally every five seconds sometimes um, and talk about what they just said and how um, manipulative that is. And we talk about the different mind control techniques that are being used in that talk. So. All right. Yeah. Thoughts on things and stuff. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, we love you. Uh, thanks for, thanks for tuning in, Jonathan. And of course, Camille also writes, I bought it on audible. So we got Thank you at you least so two purchases Thank today. You. I think we're going to get you tens of thousands of purchases oh. before this is all over. <laughs> Thank you. That's so my much. goal. That's and I my wanted goal. to say to Shannon real quick too. She said, um, I gaslit myself and I want to make it really clear. The church gaslit you and maybe you repeated those patterns or came up with some creative new ways to repeat those patterns to yourself. Um, but that's what they wanted you to do. I, I, I want to be sure that we get out of this blame the victim and blame reversal stuff as much as we can. That's part of deconditioning um, is it's not your fault. You didn't gaslight yourself. They wanted to gaslight you and they gaslight you. Yeah. So when, when Mormons refer to being self gaslit, you're saying that's a, that's a product of blame reversal. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You can't gaslight yourself. You can just be under the influence of undue influence by someone who's gaslighting you. Correct. And, and again, you might get creative, like maybe there's a cognitive dissonance that, that they haven't answered for you in ahead of time. And so you're, you, you might be creative and inventing your own new form of gaslighting, but that again, they're motivating you to do that. They're the ones that pu are putting you in an impossible position where you are being forced to uh, gaslight yourself. I don't even want to say it like, but they're the ones doing it. So. Well, Luna, just to conclude, I just want to say we have so many great thinkers in in the space of progressive and post Mormonism. D. Michael Gwynn, Quinn passed away recently. Oh, I didn't you know, know that. we yeah he 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 passed away just oh. just uh, last week or the week before. Oh. Um, so condolences to him and his family. But yeah. you know, we've talked about Fawn Brody and, and Juanita Brooks. We've talked about Leonard Arrington. We've we've talked about. Simon Southerton and Richard Bushman. And, uh, and of course we have today Radio Free Mormon and, and Bill Real and Natasha Helfer. So, you know, Lindsay Hanson Park, so many amazing thinkers and thought leaders. And I just want to add you to that list. I've discovered you recently and you, you deserve to be up there. And this, this book really is groundbreaking. And so I just want to thank you so much for your contributions. You really do deserve to be a, you are a thought leader. And I really hope that this podcast helps give you the place you deserve within our people. So thank you. Thank you so much, John. I'm, I'm, I have trouble self-promoting and I'm, I'm bad at it and I hate doing it. And so, um, I, I really appreciate, I, I'm the type of person that sits around and waits to be acknowledged and it never happens. So, um, I, I, I really, I just, uh, I, I almost want to cry. Thank you so much for that. Um, thank you. well, that stops today, Luna. That stops today. <laughs> Thanks a lot. All right. So we'll, we'll, we'll plan when our next, uh, we'll be doing four more of these. So we'll plan when the next one is, is that all right, Luna? Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited. Looking forward to it. Thanks okay. A lot. Thanks Luna. Yep. Thanks. Thanks so much. And thanks all our listeners for joining us today on Mormon stories podcast. Uh, thank you again to Randy bell for, uh, really urging me to interview Luna. Thanks to Streeter. Thanks to Natasha. Thanks to Anthony Miller and all the others that recommended it. Thanks to all our listeners and our donors who support us. We could not do Mormon Stories podcast or keep the Open Stories Foundation alive without the donors. And so I just want to thank everyone who contributes. I also want to say that less than one out of a thousand of our donors actually donates, of, of our listeners or viewers actually donates. And because of COVID, because of financial constraints, we are are losing donors every day. We are constantly losing donors. And if our listeners uh, feel moved upon when you guys sign up to become monthly donors, 
that is what keeps us in business. So if you value this programming, if you want to see it continue, if you uh, if you like Mormon Stories podcast and don't want to see it go away, please become a monthly donor to uh, Mormon Stories and the Open Stories Foundation. You can go to mormonstories.org on your mobile device or on your web on your on a web page. There's a donate button at the top. You click on it. You type in, you can either check a box or type in how much you want to donate monthly. You become a monthly donor and it's all tax deductible in the United States. We're transparent in our finances. Um, all the money goes towards supporting the cause of the Open Stories Foundation of Mormon Stories. And we'll keep providing this content and creating new content for as long as we can. We also do our best to support communities of support so that people aren't alone. The Thrive Initiative is, is indirectly supported through, through Mormon Stories and the Open Stories Foundation. There's so much good that, that we want to do and will do coming out of COVID. So please become a monthly donor and, um, and, and we'll do many more good things. Thanks again for the support. Email us at mormonstories at gmail.com with your feedback, comment. You can share um, all of our podcasts um, on social media, on TikTok, on, on, uh, on Facebook, on Twitter. Uh, that's one thing you can do to promote us in addition to or, or in replace of donating financially if you can't. And just spreading the word. You can also give it a positive review on, uh, on Facebook, on our Mormon Stories Podcast Facebook page, or on the Apple Podcasting app. And wherever else you can give us a positive review. We're always getting haters giving us negative reviews who don't even listen to or watch our stuff. Your positive reviews can counterbalance that. So please give us a positive re review if you can. Thanks again, everybody. Stay tuned, and we'll see you guys all again very soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast.